Uh, while we're getting ready, um, if there are any elected officials in the room who have not signed up, uh, we'd like to have your name, uh, and you can go to the sign-up sheet at the back, because there'll be a special opportunity for elected officials to speak if you intend to speak. So we can't identify everybody. All right, let's get going formally. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Today is Tuesday, March 1st, 2016. This is a public hearing before the Massachusetts Gaming Commission relative to the application for a Category 1 gaming establishment license submitted by the Mass Gaming, submitted by Mass Gaming and Entertainment, LLC. My name is Steve Crosby, and I'm the chair of the commission. I'm joined by Commissioners Stebbins, Zuniga, McDonald, and Cameron. The five of us will preside over this hearing. We're located at the Conference Center at Massasoit Community College, 770 Crescent Street, Brockton, Mass. We are here in Brockton today because this is the so-called host community to the proposed gaming establishment. This means that this is where the resort casino would be located if the applicant is awarded the license by the commission. As you may know, the commission has authority to issue up to only one Category 1 casino license for each region of the state. This part of the state is located in what has been identified in our law as Region C. Mass Gaming and Entertainment is the only applicant vying for the one license to be awarded in Region C, though it is important to note that the Commission is not obliged to award a gaming license in every region. I also want to briefly comment on how the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe Casino proposal fits into the picture in the context of this Commission's authority. As you are likely aware, the Indian tribe is a sovereign entity and accordingly not subject to the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the jurisdiction of this commission. Tribal casinos are mainly governed by federal law. However, the tribe has entered into a contract with the state, which is referred to as a compact, that gives this commission some oversight of construction and operations in the event that a casino is built on tribal land. For purposes of this hearing, however, please understand that the Commission has no control over whether or when a tribal casino will be built or who may be involved in such a project. We have noted repeatedly that the issue of whether to award a Category 1 casino license in Southeastern Mass or Region C is a two-step process. First, we will determine whether we have a quality application consistent with the criteria and standards established in the expanded gaming law. If we do have a quality applicant, then we will decide whether to make the award, taking into consideration all of the circumstances at the time, including the status, if any, of the tribal casino. In response to the Commission's request for additional information about the status of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe's resort proposal, resort casino proposal in Taunton, the tribe will make a formal presentation during a public meeting before the commission on March 15th. The details of that public meeting are being finalized and will be announced publicly upon completion and shortly. The public support for this proposal, or lack of public support, is a critical factor that the commission will evaluate in making the final award of the license. Accordingly, your presence here today and the written comments that many of you have submitted will play a pivotal role in, the, in our decision. We thank you and thank you very much for being a part of this process. Before we begin the public hearing, I'd like to lay out the process and establish the ground rules that we'll be following here today. The hearing, which is provided for by Section 17 of Chapter 23K of the Massachusetts General Laws, which is our expanded gaming law, and Section 118.05 of the Commission's regulations, is intended to provide the Commission with the opportunity to address questions and concerns relative to the proposal of the gaming applicant to build a gaming establishment. The inquiry may include topics related to the scope and quality of the gaming area and amenities, the integration of the gaming establishment into the surrounding community, and the extent of required mitigation plans. Additionally, the Commission will receive input from members of the public from host and surrounding communities. The hearing will begin with a presentation by the applicant, followed by questions any of the commissioners may have for the applicant. Next, we will offer the mayor, offer the mayor of Brockton, Bill Carpenter, and any other elected officials interested, any other elected officials who are interested, an opportunity to comment. 
We will then allow presentations to be made by representatives from each of the surrounding communities and any impacted live entertainment venues that choose to do so. They will be followed by a representative from Stand Up for Brockton. After these presentations, we will open the floor to public comments and questions. At the conclusions of the comments and questions from members of the public, we will afford the applicant an opportunity to make any closing comments that it would like to make. Any commissioner may at any time ask a question of the applicant or for that matter of anybody else. In an effort to make the best use of all of our time, we ask that any member of the public proceed as follows in addressing the commission. First, any member of the public who would like to address the commission must be on our list of speakers. If you sent an email to the address on our website by close of business yesterday, your name has already been added to the list. If you have not sent us an email or signed up when you entered the building today and you would like to be heard, please be sure to add your name to that list and as I said, the sign up sheet is at the back of the room. Second, when I call your name, please come up to the microphone and state your name and tell us where you are from. In the interest of time, I'll call a few names at a time and ask that folks line up behind the speaker until it's your turn. Third, in order to ensure that everyone who wants to speak gets an opportunity to do so, and we already have about 50 people signed up in addition to the other speakers, we ask that you please limit your comments to three minutes in length. We have a clock up front, which I believe is here, so that will count down the time so you'll be able to see how much time has elapsed. Also, please be sure that your comments or questions relate to the particulars of this proposal and not to your views on gaming or casinos in general. Finally, we recognize the great passion that many of you have for this subject matter, both for and against. We welcome your comments to reflect that passion. However, in order for this part of the process to achieve its greatest value, it is tremendously important that the discourse here today remain at all times civil. This is one area that we can all likely agree on. For those who have submitted written comments about this project, please know that the Commission will review and consider each and every one of them. Thank you all for taking the time to send them in. At the conclusion of the proceedings today, the Commission will keep this hearing open and continue this public hearing to a further date yet to be determined. Notice of the next hearing date will be provided to the city or town clerk of each host and surrounding community and will be posted on our website, www.massgaming.com. With that, I will ask the applicant to please identify its representatives and begin the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Crosby and members of the commission. Good afternoon. Um, afternoon. Hello to everybody from Brockton. Thanks for coming. We, we're, we're delighted to be here, and we thank you for the opportunity to present in, in this town. Uh, I'd like to recognize first uh, Mayor Carpenter, who is in the room, the Mayor of Brockton, and thank him for coming today. George Carney, our partner in this project and the long-term um, <coughs> owner and operator of the, of the Brockton Fairgrounds, who we've been dealing with for quite a while. We're happy to have him here. Speakers today and, and uh, other persons who may not speak but who are available for questions are, will be the following. First of all, Neil Bloom who you've all met, who is the chairman of Rush Street um, Gaming and has addressed you before. Uh, Joe Shabetta, who is the vice president of operations uh, and, and shovels back and forth through the various properties. Uh, Mary Cheeks, who was formerly the vice president of finance for the two facilities in Pennsylvania that Rush Street operates, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but has recently been uh, promoted to general manager of the casino that's currently under construction in Schenectady, New York. The rush will be opening and operating. Uh, Scott Struzner, who, is in, who you've all probably met during the course of this, who's worked tirelessly on this project. He's an executive with the Bloom family office uh, who has helped oversee the project. Ryan Tennant, uh, director of finance for um, Rush Street, has uh, also tirelessly worked on that. Uh, in addition to those employees, we have Mike Levin, who is a develop uh, with the company Development Management Associates. And Mike's uh, a planner and who has worked with uh, Neil Bloom for over 30 years uh, in, in designing and uh, helping build the beautiful projects that, that, that we do have, and uh, has designed every one of the casinos that I know all of you commissioners have have seen. 
Um, Mike Saul, who is the president of the Innovation Group, a financial analyst uh, group that specializes in casino matters, is present. David Tennant, who is the um, managing uh, partner of the appellate practice and Indian law and gaming practice for Nixon Peabody out of the Washington office and who has a, a large presence in, in the Boston area. Also, Michael Michaud, who's a major for MDM Transportation, obviously our transportation consultant uh, locally. Charles LeRae, partner in Dane Torpy, a land use permitting and zoning expert who's helped in our, our program through this. And uh, Steve uh, Martorano, who's with Bowler Engineering, our civil engineering, uh, uh, local civil engineering uh, consultant. With that, I will turn the microphone over to Neil Bloom, and uh, thank you again, uh, citizens of Brockton, for having us here. Thanks, John. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission, thank you for giving me this opportunity to address you, and thank all the uh, residents of Brockton and other interested citizens who are here today. Um, we're very excited about this project. We think it's going to be the best project for the Commonwealth. And we're very excited to try to build a better Brockton and a better future for the city of Brockton. Uh, our proposal will be amongst the largest commercial developments in southeastern Massachusetts. It's going to cost somewhere around $677 million. Uh, we'll be paying an $85 million license fee. It will make about $700 million of gaming tax revenue over the next 10 years. That's net of any losses or cannibalization that the other casinos would incur uh, because there's a new casino in Region C. Uh, we'll have 1,800 permanent casino jobs plus 2,000 construction jobs. This will help revitalize Brockton, which greatly needs a boost, and all of southeastern part of the Commonwealth. We will open, if we're selected shortly, in the spring of 2019, or possibly sooner if we can get some of the permitting done uh, that could possibly push it into late 2018. It could possibly be the first full service casino to open in the Commonwealth. Let me spend a minute uh, telling you all uh, who I am for a second, uh, especially because we're uh, meeting the citizens of uh, our host community. Um, I grew up in Chicago, um, of, uh, raised by a single uh, working mother, I raised my sister and me. Um, we were not wealthy to say the least. My mother worked hard. I went to the University of Illinois. Uh, I think my, uh, my tuition at those days was $95 a, a semester. Uh, I graduated with a degree in accounting. I was a CPA. Uh, and then I went to law school on a scholarship at Northwestern University. Uh, when I graduated, I went to work for a large law firm in Chicago. I might have been the largest. I became a young partner but I always wanted to go into business. So I joined my uh, roommate from college, and we started a, uh, he had started a few months before, we started a small real estate company with three people from scratch. And over the years, uh, that company called JMB Realty, and then ultimately Walton Street Capital and other companies, uh, has done more than $50 billion of developments of, and acquisitions uh, and uh, I've been fortunate to have some success. And this is a great country, America. If you get a good education, work hard, and get lucky. Um, I got into the uh, casino business uh, several years ago uh, and founded Rush Street Gaming. Um, one of the key elements of uh, what we do is we're basically real estate developers at heart. Uh, we do quality development. We are very proud of the projects that we do. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of them, but uh, in Boston, I want to mention a couple of projects we've been involved in. Uh, we were involved uh, early in, in our history at JMB uh, with the Rouse Company, uh, 
who was attempting to develop Faneuil Hall. I met Jim Rouse, uh, liked him, liked the project, and we agreed to put up most of the equity and we were a 50-50 partner in uh, Faneuil Hall. At that time, uh, nobody knew uh, what Faneuil Hall would turn into. It was somewhat controversial, and uh, obviously it's a project we're very proud to have been involved in. We owned our 50% stake for many years and sold it some years ago. We also were, are, were involved in the development of Copley Place in Boston. Uh, that project was started by a company called Urban Investment and Development. Uh, we provided the, most of the equity to develop the project, and bef uh, before the entire project was completed, uh, we ended up buying Urban and owned 100% of Copley Place uh, for many, many years. And I must say, when Copley Place was developed, that area didn't look anything like it does today. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, Copley Place went into a, a public REIT that we formed. That REIT merged with other companies, uh, but we still remain an interest, although we don't uh, manage the property. Uh, that, and the interest is really the, uh, the uh, shopping centers, the hotels we sold off some years ago. And we've built uh, other great properties in Chicago, Century City, uh, that we're very proud of. And first and foremost, we do high quality properties that we can be uh, proud of. So let me tell you a little bit about our uh, experience in gaming. I think, I don't know, something like 15 years ago, we got involved in uh, developing a casino in Canada for the government of Ontario, the Falls View Casino. Um, we won an RFP, uh, we're selected to do so. Uh, we built about a billion dollar resort casino. It's a beautiful project and that's how we got into the gaming business. Uh, we still run that for the government. Um, I'm chairman of the board of that company. Uh, after that, we decided to get involved in development uh, here in the United States. And over the years, particularly since the Great Recession, I think it's fair to say we've been the major developer of casinos in, in major U.S. cities uh, here in the United States. Um, we have developed a casino in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we developed a casino in uh, Philadelphia. This is all since the recession. We developed a casino uh, in Cook County where Chicago is located. All of these cas casinos are very successful uh, and you'll hear more about that. And we're currently uh, developing, as you heard, a casino in what's called the Capital Region in New York. The state of New York issued four licenses. Uh, we were successful in being awarded the license at Capital Region, which covers Albany, Troy, Schenectady, um, and uh, Saratoga. There's almost a, a million people in that surrounding area. A um, couple of situations uh, that I think I should mention, which really deals with us getting what I call getting the job done even in tough times. And I want to give you a quick uh, uh, history of a couple of projects. Uh, and they were different. In Pittsburgh, uh, the casino license there was issued to a developer uh, who was going to build it in Pittsburgh. He started construction. Uh, and this was 2008 when the Great Recession was starting. That developer ran into serious financial trouble, didn't have the financial resources. Uh, the uh, contractor and employees were walk, going to walk off the job. It was facing potential bankruptcy when it just started. Uh, we, I get a call from the contractor. We were already licensed in Pennsylvania to do the deal in, in uh, Philadelphia. So we rescued the project with the encouragement of the gaming board and the governor. Uh, we put in new equity, uh, restructured everything, developed that project, and it's currently uh, the leading project in the Pittsburgh area uh, with a very large market share and a wonderful project. Second situation occurred in Philadelphia, which had a, a different situation. There, uh, the, under the Gaming Act in Pennsylvania, two casinos were supposed to be licensed awarded in the city of, uh, of Philadelphia. They awarded one to us and one to another group uh, that had very strong financial backers, 
very wealthy individuals and uh, developers and a major uh, 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 casino company. Uh, so financial resources were not the issue. But the Great Recession hit, by the way those licenses were awarded in late 2007. So when 2008 arose, we had the financial crisis. Um, uh, we built our casino. We were the first casino, I believe, built in this country after recession. These, the sponsors of the other project in Philadelphia changed their mind. Oh, they said they were going to start construction. They kept saying, we're going to do it. We're just wait, give us more time, give us more time. The gaming board finally ran out of patience and revoked their license. Uh, and we're the only casino in, uh, in Philadelphia right now um, uh, because the world changed and conditions were not f so favorable in 2008 and 2009 for them to want to put up their money. Uh, even though they had promised that they would. Um, we just recently completed the addition. Well, we opened it up. We're completing it next month. A $164 million addition to our project in Philadelphia. Uh, it's going to add another 500 jobs and produce a lot more revenue for the state. Now, let me talk about this project because that's why we're here. Um, and I want to first talk to you about this site. Okay? I'm in the real estate business, so location, location, location is critical. Uh, we were looking around Region C. We looked at a lot of sites. And we were not satisfied with any of the sites that we found that would make us want to move forward to develop a casino there. And we thought a lot about it. I got a call to go down and look at this fairground site in Brockton. So uh, we went down, and I met George Carney, who was the owner of the site. Uh, George uh, Carney is a long-term resident of Brockton. Uh, on this property, he had originally a racetrack, uh, which closed down, and is now a, uh, a, a, a vacant except for an annual fair that they have. So it's called the fairgrounds. This is an incredible site. Uh, it's over uh, roughly 40 acres plus. And what excited us so much was a couple of things. First, it's one mile approximately off of Route 24, a major uh, highway, as you know. Um, the distance from that highway to this site was roughly the same distance that we had for our casino in Des Plaines uh, near Chicago, which is so successful. The, um, so those factors were really important to us. Another factor was its location. Uh, it's 20 miles roughly from the Boston border, uh, but it's 17 miles from where a casino might be built in Taunton if that should happen. And that was a key factor to us. If we were going to build a casino, if there ever was going to be a tribal casino, we wanted to make sure that we could be successful and survive. And being 17 miles closer to Boston than Towton, we felt right off the Route 24, uh, we would be successful with or without a casino uh, in Towton. Obviously, we'll do better if we're alone, but we'll still have a good investment if there's both of them. Uh, so we couldn't be more excited about this uh, site. I shook hands with George when I met him. We made a deal. Uh, he transfers his land into our venture. He'll be a partner in our project. And we have a great relationship. And I've enjoyed working with George uh, and his uh, group and family on this project. And he loves Brockton. Uh, he's lived here, I guess, virtually your whole life. Um, so let me move on now to what we would build on this property, OK? And for that, I'd like to call on Mike Levin. You've heard Mike uh, has worked with me for over 30 years. I believe Mike was with Urban when we bought Urban. And uh, so he worked on uh, some of our projects just by way of example. Uh, we, uh, owned, uh, we developed and owned a very major project in Chicago where there's a Bloomingdale shopping mall, the Four Seasons Hotel, condominiums, office space, a uh, parking, uh, a major retail complex. They worked on the development of that. 
I worked on our projects in Century City where we built a good part of Century City in Los Angeles. And most importantly, he has developed uh, for us all of the casinos that I've mentioned today, other than the one in uh, Canada. Uh, so with that, I'd like to call on uh, Mike to tell you what we're going to build on this site. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Just before you start, I just want to see Janice. Uh, is it possible to get any more chairs? Do you know? They're coming? They're coming? Okay, good. There are a few seats uh, around here for those folks who are standing up. If you want them here in front, there, there are a handful around if you want them. Okay, excuse me. Okay. My name is Michael Levin, um, and I'm the founding principal of Development Management Associates. Uh, my background is architecture and city planning. Uh, we've been involved in uh, overseeing design and construction of uh, projects all over the country for Neil and others. Uh, as he said, we've been working with Neil since the mid-80s, and we have done all of his casinos uh, to date. Um, give you a little overview of the project. As Neil said, it's a $677 million investment. Uh, the gaming floor, 92,000 uh, square feet, 2,100 slots, 124 games. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the non-gaming elements of this project because those are really what's going to make a difference in terms of creating a major resort and tourist destination. Uh, we're going to have an expansive food and beverage uh, program. Uh, this ownership feels very strongly on providing quality dining experiences and a variety of venues. And what you really have to just go look at their properties fantastic restaurants. In fact, I think probably the best testimony is you have people going to these restaurants to eat that have no interest in gambling. They are going to the restaurants uh, to eat. So that's a major amenity to this project. We're going to talk more about the hotel. It's 250 rooms with a spa. I'll share with you the plans because it's, it's going to be a gorgeous, it's going to be a gorgeous hotel. It really is and will really add to the, uh, uh, to the project here. Uh, the multi-purpose room, uh, 26,000 feet. This is going to provide us the ability to have a number of activities. This includes entertainment, meetings, uh, weddings, exhibits. Uh, we will be able to subdivide that room so we can accommodate smaller venues or larger venues and it really um, relates and supports both the hotel and the casino activities. It's really uh, an essential element of the of the program here. So I think all of these with the casino are going to combined to really provide, again, a, an incredible destination uh, resort uh, facility for the, for the region. Next. Um, let's talk design. Um, it, it's interesting because I think casino developers have maybe two basic philosophies. The first one is kind of a Las Vegas, let's build something large, flashy, huge, high-rise, uh, you know, eye-catching. Um, this ownership's philosophy is exactly the opposite. Uh, the most important criteria for us is that the facility fit into the community in which it's located. It should reflect the architecture of the community. It should be the appropriate scale and we call it contextual architecture. And I think the best way to illustrate that is if you go to any of the other uh, developments that they have uh, developed, you go to Chicago, go to Pittsburgh, you go to Philadelphia, obviously Schenectady is just under construction. None of these look alike, you, except for there's a, you know, obviously good quality service. You would never know they're by the same owners because each one is very different um, based on the context in which it's located. We think that's very important for regional casino. Uh, in this particular drawing here, uh, sketch, you can see some of the design elements that we will implement. Uh, you see an extensive use of red brick. Uh, we've got gabled hip roofs. Uh, we're going to have areas of metal roofs. Um, we're going to have clear story windows uh, and a lot of, of traditional uh, New England uh, icons like uh, steeples and such. So this is coming in actually off of West Street, which is one of our uh, major entrances. Uh, next. This is a shot coming in off of Forest Avenue. Um, Again, it was very important for us to break up these buildings into, into their individual components. 
Uh, and what this drawing shows here, you can see the garage on the right. It's very important to know that's a masonry facade on the garage. It's going to fit in contextually uh, with, with the rest of the project. Um, this ownership has always been committed to good design. And I can just tell you the process when we go through design with, with, with this client is that everybody's at the table. Ownership's at the table. Operations is at the table. We don't have a design meeting that these gentlemen are not involved with. They know every square inch, every piece of material, every, they're very involved owners in terms of design. And all you have to do is, I think, go to the projects. I mean, you can look at all these pretty pictures. You go to the projects and the design is just is incredible. Uh, they committed to, uh, in our last project, to try to achieve lead gold in our casino and displays. had never been done, and it was really pioneering, and we achieved it with, with, uh, with their support. Uh, we've, we've gotten very good feedback from the community on this design, and I, I think what we're proposing here, um, in addition to the financial uh, benefits, uh, which Neil's talked to, this is a beautiful complex, and I think it's really going to be an asset to, uh, to the city of Brooklyn. Next. Uh, this is the site plan. Um, as Neil said, uh, th this was so ideal in terms of a site. One of the biggest attributes here is here's Belmont Street. We have a major exposure of the site to Belmont Street. Uh, this is important from two standpoints. One, Belmont Street's a, a major arterial serving the region already. Number two, most of our customers are, are, are coming from here. So it made sense to orient the buildings uh, in that direction. So you can see here, kind of, this is the active part of the complex, you know, facing where the, where the traffic and the customers are coming in. Uh, this is the quad, what we call the quiet or more inactive. This is basically employee parking. Um, what's critical also is that the vehicular access Here's one entrance drive, here's the other, you saw the sketches. It's gotta be a very clear, logical vehicular circulation because what you have here, you have your regular customers, they're here all the time, they know they come on a Thursday at seven o'clock, they know where to park, they know exactly what the activity level. We are gonna get a major input of tourists here, maybe they've never been here, they maybe come once a year to this facility. When they come to this project, they have to, it's gotta be easy to get around. Whether they're going to the hotel, going to the casino, going to the parking garage. So we have to provide a very clear uh, circulation plan. This is the hotel right here, it's six stories. We located it uh, up near Belmont Street. This is the casino in the middle. There'll be a direct connection between the hotel and the casino. And then here's our parking garage, uh, which again provides direct access into the hotel. And we've provided a balance of parking, to be honest with you, uh, in all of our facilities, there's some customers that prefer surface parking. Unless it, the weather's terrible, they prefer surface parking. We have other customers who like to go on parking decks. They know they're going to get very easy, accessible parking. So we provide a balance of both in our facilities. Uh, the other major design determinant here was buffer. It's, ironically, when we started on the project and reviewed the zoning code, um, zoning code required a 20-foot setback. Uh, next to residential. Before we even talked to the community, we said that's inadequate. It just it would not be responsible for us to, to just, we, we meet the zoning code, but that, that just doesn't make sense. So you can see here, this is an 80 foot, we've committed to an 80 foot landscaped uh, area between us and the residential. Again, the, the requirement is 20 feet. And in fact, in terms of the definition of setback, you could, under the current zoning you could have built a building 20 feet from the property line we're not only doing the 80 feet you can see actually our buildings are much farther back either due to roads or um, uh, parking areas so we well exceed uh, the zoning requirement uh, the other area of uh, important buffer is here where we have a detention pond again across from the school this is a, a major visual and major buffer uh, to the neighborhood to the to the kind of the south and west of us. Next. Um, talk a little bit, I'll touch a little bit on the building plan here. Here's the casino. Again, 92,000 square feet. Um, Security is very important. I know questions have come up in terms of minors getting in and I think Joe or Mary will talk to that. We have three secure entrances to this, only three. One is here to the surface lot. 
One is here to the hotel, and one to the south here, which you can't see too well, is to the garage. That's it. There are three secure entrances uh, to the facility. Um, here's that multi-purpose space which we talked about, which we think will be a, a real add to the project. Um, talk a little bit about the hotel. Hotel just doesn't get much attention. This will be a gorgeous hotel. You can see it up here. We have a beautiful courtyard behind the hotel. Meeting rooms are going to spill out into this outdoor courtyard. Here's a major spa. Here's a uh, swimming pool. Major landscaping up here. Um, this is really, again, kind of a quiet area of the site, which all the activity going up front here, this can be a very attractive and uh, you know, quiet area of the site. I know that there's been questions raised about the Brockton Fairgrounds Exhibit Hall. That's located here. Um, I guess let me make two comments on that. It, it's, it's fallen in disuse. It's a gorgeous building. As an architect, you, you take a look at that and you want to do something. Well, when you put a you know, $675 million investment next door to you, you know that's got to trigger some interest in that building. Uh, more important, you can see our plans here. Uh, we really were right across the street. Again, our spa, our pool, it could very easily relate to what we're doing. We don't own it. Again, just to, we don't own that building. But I think with us being there, I think there's a good chance something could happen uh, quite useful uh, with that building. Uh, next, again, a little bit more on the hotel. Uh, it's going to be a major feature and a major draw for tourism. It's going to be a gorgeous hotel. Next. Um, let me talk a little bit about, um, there's been discussion of the master plan here. And again, I'm an old planner. Um, there, several things are happening here. Number one, in terms of this development, $675 million investment somewhat uh, the projections are somewhat less than five million visitors a year okay so you've got a major generator a major catalyst for development okay you've got a significant amount of vacant or underutilized land around us okay number two number three you have some institutions like campanelli stadium and the shaw center that are underutilized that, that need help and we're going to do some cross promotion with them, but you kind of have a dream situation from a planning standpoint. You got a major catalyst, you got vacant land, and you got institutions that need help. So, you know, bottom line is we very much support the creation of the entertainment district master plan. In addition to funding it, which was one, you know, one of the things here, more than fund it, we want to be actively involved in the creation of that master plan. Um, Obviously, it's to our benefit. We're going to be a major stakeholder. We're going to be a major investor. But to have more development we have around us, the better that it's going to make this as a focal point for the region. So, you know, again, we, we encourage development. It should be done in a logical fashion. So we are very supportive of, uh, of the master plan. And I think what's exciting here is that uh, you know, a lot of master plans gather dust. They're beautiful drawings, booklets, you put them away. You never see them again. This master plan has the ability to be real because if we're fortunate to get the license, you're going to have a, a complex there generating you know, close to 5 million visitors, you know, six, seven million, hundred million dollars of investment. This master plan can be real if it's done right. We, we have a lot of master planning experience. We, we actually went through a master plan in Pittsburgh. Just real quickly, uh, as, as Neil said, we have a casino in Pittsburgh. Next door to us is the Carnegie Science Center, major institution in Pittsburgh. Uh, next to there is uh, the stadium, uh, Steeler Stadium. So we, uh, there's an organization there called River Life, which is a publicly funded, uh, I'm sorry, privately funded organization, kind of monitors the river there. They came to us and we worked with them and the Carnegie Science, all the stakeholders to come up with a, a master plan for our area because it was on the river, which was in, in, in Pittsburgh is sacred. So. Again, I think there's tremendous opportunity here, and uh, we want to be involved with it. So, um, I think I'll turn it over now to, to Bob Michaud. Bob is a managing partner, uh, principal, at MDM Transportation, and I think he'll be talking about uh, both the traffic improvements and the public transportation system. Uh, Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Robert Michaud, Managing Principal with MDM. <clears throat> um, this project 
represents the pinnacle of a multi-year uh, and exhaustive process of identifying a site that could properly accommodate the needs and market position of a full service resort uh, casino facility. Uh, we have been personally involved, I've been personally involved uh, in a number of meetings in living rooms, in restaurants, in meeting halls in this community uh, to understand what community concerns are and to see how we can mesh two specific goals of this facility with the community input. Uh, first, uh, that this site, and, and Neil mentioned it, uh, location is everything. This site is directly uh, located on an arterial connection to a regional highway system. Location is everything. The ability to get customers in from a regional destination as a regional facility is very important. It's important from the customer experience perspective uh, and, and the market position of the project. Eight out of ten customers who will be visiting this facility will be originating from a regional origin and will be using regional highway systems, not local streets, to get here, and that's an important factor. And the second goal uh, speaks to being a good neighbor, and from the very first time that we uh, had discussions with Rush Street about five years ago, uh, it was a very important aspect of their um, philosophy to be a good neighbor in any project that they've been involved with. Uh, being a good neighbor means that they leave things better than they found them, that they serve as a catalyst for making improvements that enhance a community, not detract from it, uh, and that uh, uh, offers compatibility with a longer term vision of growth for a community. And we believe that both of those goals are met in the following ways. First, that this site is located a mile east of Route 24 along a section of Belmont Street that has already been targeted by MassDOT for substantial infrastructure enhancement. Over six million dollars of monies are now being spent over the next two years to substantially improve Belmont Street as a gateway to this community, not only for vehicular travel but for pedestrian accessibility as well which is a very important aspect of what Brockton is all about. Pedestrian accessibility, bicycle accessibility, uh, as well as auto accessibility. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, likewise, uh, being a good neighbor uh, here, uh, uh, as it relates to gateways, uh, we were very pleased to, to see that there have been ongoing uh, efforts by regional planning, Old Colony Planning Council, as well as the city to enhance infrastructure independent of what's being proposed here. And, and the range of improvements involve the Forest Avenue Quarter, which is a very important roadway connection within, within the city, uh, as well as portions of West Street to the north and Route 27. Despite planning efforts identifying a whole host of infrastructure needs, no one's come up with the money or the means to implement those. And so this project really represents a catalyst to make that happen. This developer offers a $10.2 million package that is above and beyond the $6.5 million that is already committed and in play by MassDOT. The combination of that funding, some $17 million, will, will effectively provide the highest performing infrastructure of any licensed facility, gaming facility, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And when I say that, I mean that the ability for the roadways to accommodate vehicular travel and pedestrian accommodation is no better than what you will find at this location when this is complete. Uh, and that's a very unique finding among all, more than 20 sites that we've personally looked at for this proponent. Uh, were our review of all of the other licensed facilities in the Commonwealth. Uh, <clears throat> as it relates to the second question, how to be a good neighbor, uh, one of the aspects that Mike Levin touched on is uh, the ability for this project to fit in the context of the neighborhood with, with uh, where it sits. Uh, and, and this neighborhood is being targeted as a location by the city that will be an entertainment venue uh, location. Uh, so the infrastructure, as it's uh, listed on the slide before you, specifically 
accommodates that need. You'll see that a primary feature of that design is a roundabout feature which effectively knits together a series of roadways to a common design element uh, that over time would allow for the development of adjoining parcels uh, being able to plug in with that infrastructure. So the infrastructure that's being planned is not only consistent with the goals that were identified by regional planning, it is compatible with the longer term goal of the entertainment district generally without having to change anything. Uh, <clears throat> Another uh, way that this fits in well with the community is that we very early in the process understood that the relationship of the high school to the property was a sensitive issue. And of course, the, the site borders a, a significant residential community to the east and to the south. In that regard, pedestrian safety is a major concern uh, and the ability to properly serve the access and circulation needs of the property as a distinct element apart from those land uses was another very primary uh, objective of the design, and we've achieved both of those uh, as follows. Uh, that any of the improvements you see on this board, whether it's a realignment of West Street here, a widening of Forest Avenue here, or the introduction of new signalized intersections along that quarter, all are complemented by expansive sidewalk connections that run along both sides of all of these new roadways with controlled pedestrian crossings at the signals and the ability to get to the high school specifically distinctly from this project with a new signal. All of these are consistent with the regional planning goals that were identified in, in prior studies before this applicant uh, came before the city. Uh, and so pedestrian safety is paramount to us. Um, this accommodates that need uh, and leaves things in a much more uh, viable and, and better condition than they are now or would be without this project. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> as it relates to other aspects of transportation, this project isn't all about traffic. This is about transportation and how to best suit the needs of transportation, whether you're an employee that works here that needs to get here uh, to earn a living, to build a career, or you're uh, a patron who opts not to use an automobile to come here but would rather walk or bicycle. Uh, and in that regard, one of the important aspects of this is public transportation. Uh, we know that this area is well served today by Brockton Area Transit Authority bus service that runs throughout the city as shown in the slide. Uh, you'll see that the proximity of the site here uh, to the downtown area and the Brockton Area Transit Station, the old colony line, MBTA, is roughly a, a mile and a half away. Uh, and that BAT Center, as it's known, serves as a, as a hub for transportation, uh, the old colony line itself runs all the way from Plymouth to Boston. It has 17 stops. It integrates with service, surface bus service uh, run by BAT. Uh, one of the routes actually goes right by the site today and will provide one means of uh, getting to this facility, whether as a patron or an employee. In addition to what's shown here, we know that in every one of the Rush Street facility, uh, uh, facilities that public transportation is augmented by private shuttle service so that uh, to the extent there's the increased ability to get employees to arrive at a facility without having to drive, that shuttle service augments those existing services and this proponent is committed to doing that by providing a shuttle connection from the site to the BAT Center that matches up well with the, uh, the employee and patron patterns that we expect. So in conclusion, the, the two answers, uh, the two questions that we've looked at, um, how do you get here and can you do that efficiently uh, is well answered by its proximity to regional highway systems. And the second question about being a good neighbor really speaks to how this fits in with the neighborhood and, and all of the community input that we received and how the design has uh, come to fruition by uh, insulating the site from the residential component, relying on, on uh, regional highway systems, enhancing pedestrian safety with complete streets uh, design features, and enhancing uh, public transportation. With that, I will uh, turn the presentation to uh, Vice President of Operations for Rush Street Gaming, Mr. Joe Shibeta. Thanks, Bob. Chairman Crosby, commissioners, it's nice to see some of you again. Got to visit you at some of our properties. Um, as Mike said, world-class design sets us apart from our competitors in all of the markets. Unique to the markets they serve, all of our properties feature natural light, 
easy to na navigate casino floors, great dining and entertainment options in a clean, safe environment. Uh, I'll start with our Rivers Pittsburgh property, which opened in 2009. Sitting on Pittsburgh's North Shore, Rivers Pittsburgh is part of a sports and entertainment district that features Heinz Field, PNC Park, the Carnegie Science Center, and our beautiful casino. The property offers gaming, dining, and entertainment 24-7. Guests can enjoy first-to-market slots, great local bands, and national touring acts, watch sports on a, on a large big-screen TV in our sports bar. Our buffet and steakhouse have been nationally recognized for being best in their market, and our 20,000 square foot banquet facility has a great view of the Ohio River and, um, the, and Heinz Field. Next, Sugar House Casino. Since 2010, Sugar House has been a catalyst for the rebirth of Fishtown, the section of Philly we are proud to call home. Since opening, Sugar House has generated the highest table games win per unit in Pennsylvania, and the slots win per unit has been consistently in the top three on a monthly basis. Currently, as Neil said, we are completing a $164 million expansion that features a seven-story parking garage, 30,000 square feet uh, event center with great views of the Delaware River, a world-class poker room, high-limit gaming and VIP lounge also along the Delaware River, and five new restaurants, including three iconic Philly offerings located in, all in our new marketplace. The investment in the expansion is ownership's commitment to Philly and the state of Pennsylvania to improve the guest experience and increase revenue for the state. Rivers Displains opened in 2011. Our property in Displains changed what casinos look like in Illinois and is the world's first LEED Gold certified casino. The Displains property is our smallest, yet drives the highest revenue for our company and the state of Illinois, consistently doubling the revenue of the number two casino in the state. Situated only 10 minutes from O'Hare, at $800 win per unit, the casino generates the highest win per unit in North America. The property often experiences 75% occupancy. However, there are no traffic complaints. Featuring both service, surface and garage parking, five restaurants, including a steakhouse operated by Chicago's Gibson's Restaurant Group and Chicagoland's best high limit and VIP experience. The property partners with local convention center, entertainment district, and hotels, which is a model for what could be created here in Brockton. You'll see our Falls View Casino that Neil spoke to that um, the, the, uh, the folks built before we started Rush Street. It's a $1 billion project in, in Canada, right on the Niagara Falls River. Features first class amenities and has received a four diamond award by the, by the CAA. And finally, River Schenectady opening in 2017 in the capital region in New York. River Schenectady was officially granted one of New York's four com commercial casino licenses in December of 2015. We are currently on pace to be the first open by Q1 of 2017. Like our other properties, we feature an easy to navigate casino floor, six dining options, all provided by a local vendor that has local dining um, options in the city of Schenectady multiple entertainment options along, along with the ability to hold outdoor festivals on the Mohawk River. Our event center is flexible space that could handle concerts, multiple meetings at one time, and weddings for over 600 people. The property will feature a hotel with 164 rooms, a lobby bar and restaurant, a boardroom, and a pool and sun deck. We cater to business and casual guests alike. When complete, the property will call, pe cause people to say, wow, this is great for Schenectady and great for the capital region. It will truly re-energize the electric city. Wow is a comment I often get to hear when I, when I tour people through our properties. People are always amazed with the attention to detail and the world-class design that we put forth in all of our properties. It's a, it shows that we, Rush Street Gaming, are a game changer in the markets that we come into. We are confident because this is our sixth project that is being built from the ground up that the people of Brockton will be very proud of the property. We will continue the champion spirit of this city. It's not just our, our properties have been recognized for excellence. We are very proud that our team members have voted us best place to work in every market year over year. To be clear, our team in Philly has voted us five years in a row. Pittsburgh, five years in a row. 
and displays three years running. That's, very, that's something we're very proud of. Along with winning employment awards, we have consistently won industry awards such as Best in Gaming, Best of Chicago, and the prestigious Four Diamond Award. We take being a community partner very seriously. Rush Street Gaming takes great pride in being a significant community property par partner. We have partnered with national organizations such as the Susan Jean Komen Fund, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and local groups such as the Philadelphia Police Athletic League, Mario Lemieux Foundation, and we are a proud member of every chamber in every city that we operate in. More than writing a check, our team members take great pride in volunteering in their own community. Our leaders are members of local boards, are, and we are often provide compensation to our team members who volunteer in efforts like cleaning parks, painting community centers, and food drives. So how can we impact Brockton? Let me give you a couple examples of our ripple effect. The Philly ripple effect, I don't have the clicker. Okay, I need the, I need the next slide because I want to show you guys a couple pictures. So, uh, Sorry. All right. We can keep talking about the employment award, Jeff. <laughs> All right. So here's the ripple effect. In 2008, before Chicago, Sugar House Casino opened its doors, there was a lot of opposition to the project. There was definitely a casino no movement in Philadelphia, especially in Fishtown. Fishtown was a neglected declining community filled with abandoned buildings. As you can see from the pictures on the slide, this wasn't a place where people wanted to live, eat, play, or stay. Today, Fishtown is alive. Sugar House Casino has been a catalyst for a rebirth. Along with Sugar House Casino, Live Nation has opened a music venue called the Fillmore, bringing national acts to Fishtown. Restaurants have opened on all streets, including local distilleries and local coffee houses that were not there before. Most importantly, new construction is rampant. Property values have grown substantially. The groups that once opposed Sugar House Casino now cheer for Sugar House Casino. In fact, we have team members who work for us today that opposed in 2008. They were some of the most vocal in opposition. They're the, some of our happiest employees today. Sugar House promotes their partners in Fishtown by providing free parking to the Fillmore sponsoring a restaurant week for all the Fishtown restaurants and buying from local purveyors. It's now a hot part of town. Next, I'd like to tell you about another ripple effect in Des Plaines. While not as dramatic in physical transformation as Fishtown, the city of Des Plaines has experienced a strong positive Im impact, uh, economic impact since Rivers Casino opened in 2011. In 2010, the city collected about 1.3 million in hotel tax from eight hotels. In 2015, that number has almost doubled from the same eight hotels. Rivers Casino supports local hotels through actual booking of rooms for our casino guests, running a convenient shuttle between the hotels and the casino for ease of access, and placing room packages on our website to promote stay and play packages. Rivers Casino also partners with surrounding communities like Rosemont, Illinois, which features an entertainment district, outlet shopping center, and convention center. The partnership includes cross-promotional opportunities, advertising, and shuttle service. In closing, we're very proud of how we operate in our communities and what our team members have bestowed upon us the great place, best place to work. With that, I'll introduce Mary Cheeks, our new general manager in Schenectady, New York. Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Crosby and the commissioners. I'd like to share with you today Rush Street Gaming's commitment <clears throat> to invest in all of its team members, hiring a diverse workforce, continuous training cr to create quality jobs for the unemployed and underemployed, to hire locally by sponsoring job readiness and training programs to prepare the hosts surround and surrounding communities for quality jobs, supporting local businesses and being a great community citizen. These five commitments and initiatives represent the Rust Street culture in every city and state 
that we operate in. Now moving to team member commitment. <clears throat> As you see on this slide, we are committed to our team. Training programs in place, non-manager compensation exceeds 50,000 annually. I'll say that again. Our non-manager compensation exceeds 50,000 annually. Our philosophy of promoting from within the organization and coaching employees to achieve career goals. We have had in our Pittsburgh property over 300 internal promotions since it, it opened in August of 2009. Ongoing career development through certifications and seminars, health and dental benefits, 401k, immediately vested, tuition reimbursement, and all Rush Street, thank you, sorry, all Rush Street gaming team members receive training on the scope, practice, and procedures of their responsible gaming plan as part of new hire orientation, and we do a refreshment uh, course once a year. What I like to highlight here is the great benefits package we offer our team members. Very few gaming companies can compete with our 401k plan in terms of employer's match. Also, we instruct our team members upon hiring of our commitment to responsible gaming. We work closely with the regulators in identifying people with gambling problems and encourage them to ban themselves and, and seek help with Gamblers Anonymous. Same holds true for underage gambling. As you heard Mike mention, we'll have three entrance points into the facility. We will man 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, those entry points. And we will be aware of everyone that enter our facility. Moving next to uh, our commitment to diversity. As reflected on this slide, our Rush Street entities consist of a diverse workforce. This is not by accident. Our Des Plaines property, women 43%, minority 57%. Philadelphia, 41% women, 53% minority. Pittsburgh, 40% women, 28% minority. And for our senior leadership of vice president and above, 45% women and 35% minority. Also, as uh, Joe had mentioned, or somewhere along the line, I've been recently uh, promoted to general manager of our Rush Street property in upstate New York. Out of our four U.S. properties, two are um, run or led by females and two by males. Interesting story in the Philly property that I'm transitioning out of, out of our eight senior leaders, seven are women and one male. So we're a very diverse organization. Moving on to our commitment to quality jobs, Rush Street creates life-changing jobs at each of its casinos. As you can see on the slide, 35% of Sugar House team members were unemployed. We accomplish hiring the under unemployed by partnering with key workforce agencies and local community colleges in developing training programs. We work tirelessly before opening to make sure all team members are set up for success in their role uh, prior the, the role that they're hired for. During the PA property, it's a relicensing hearing, team members stand up and tell their story of how important the casino is to their life and, and, you know, and their overall employment. We had one gentleman stand up and talk about being homeless before he was hired by Sugar House. And now three years later, he has his first car and home. A young lady that talks about how you know she's had her first real Christmas for her children. So these are life-changing jobs with good salaries. This is particularly important and relevant to Brockton and its unemployment stats. It will help change that. Moving on to our commitment in identifying great candidates locally. I covered this, but just to reiterate, Rush Street Gaming will hire locally. To share with you a meeting I had yesterday with the five workforce agencies in upstate New York and the uh, local community college, we put together a plan to focus on the local hiring and create job readiness programs, to name a few of the programs, how to deal with customers and deliver great service, math test training for table game dealers and cashiers, dressing for success to win the job. We not only recruit locally, we train locally to ensure we have great candidates. We tra uh, we're training more than a year out to prepare for the workforce upon opening. Moving on to our support of local business, 
Through our Rush Rewards program, we partner with local businesses. This is done by encouraging our customers to use their loyalty reward points in local venues. And you can see listed on a slide those venues. We, are, we hold continuous vendor fairs to create local business connections. We work with the business, um, we work with the various business on how to conduct business with the casino for regulatory requirements and how to submit winning bids. We also assist in partnering smaller businesses to be able to increase capacity to serve us, uh, all, as well as partnering them with national suppliers. As you can see, our annual spend and local, uh, for local businesses and minority and women business enterprise is significant. To conclude, Rush Street Gaming is not your average gaming entity. We have a rich culture that I spoke about in our commitments, and this is why I'm proud to work for this company. Rush Street Gaming is the third gaming entity that I have worked for and none other compare. compare. This culture is why our casinos operate successfully in both financial performance and customer and team member satisfaction. Rush Street Gaming will make Brockton a better place. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to I'll turn it back to our chairman, Neil. Thanks, Mary. So I want to talk to you about the economics of this project. Um, first, let me explain that we're going to invest our own money into this project. We're not a public company where we have to do another deal to keep show growth or keep our stock price going. Uh, this is our own capital. And we have highly confident letters from four major banks, um, some of whom I've done business with virtually my entire life. And there's no way I'm going to do a deal that I don't believe is going to be successful, uh, is going to be a good investment, or that the banks or the citizens would be embarrassed. We, are, we have commitments from uh, uh, Wells Fargo, probably the most successful bank in the country, uh, who I've done business with for years. I have a, commit, uh, a, a highly confident letter, I should say, from Wells Fargo, a highly confident letter from Goldman Sachs, similar situation, done business forever, um, Credit Suisse, and Fifth Third Bank. Now, when I go through these economics, I, I want to divide them into two sections. I want to take you through the economics if we're the only casino in Region C, and then separately if there are two casinos in Region C, us and the Towton Tribal Casino. Okay, so starting out first uh, with just us alone. Okay, the first thing we look at when we go into a market, this is kind of economics 101, is how many gaming positions are there in the market in relationship to the, po the adult population in the market? And you can see on page 30 that there are 355 adults for every gaming position in this market. And we've included the Wynn Project, the Penn Project, Twin Rivers, Newport Grand, and of course our project. As you can see, okay, there are far more adults per gaming position, assuming we're built, okay, than there are in these major markets, and in particularly three of those markets, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Chicago, where we're very successful operations have far less people per gaming position than we will have in Brockton, significantly more. Uh, there's 135 in Sugar House, 191 in Pittsburgh, 224 in Chicago, which does phenomenal, and we'll have 355 in Brockton. And I might add that another factor is the propensity of that, that citizens to like to gamble, and people like to gamble in the Commonwealth. Um, Next, next slide is the, uh, our location, and that helps explain some of the reason that we're so enthusiastic, okay? We're 27 miles from the Wynn Everett project. The, by the way, we, we judge distance by driving, not by fly, not by the fly, okay? Uh, we're 27 miles from Plain Ridge. We're 42 miles from Twin Rivers, and we're 49 miles from Newport Grand. And when you look at where we are, we are strategically located 
all right? roughly 20 miles from Boston, okay? Uh, so we're really in an in a, in a excellent position to gather uh, a significant amount of revenue uh, south of Boston all the way to, uh, to the water, et cetera. Now I want to point out a very important factor on, on slide 32, okay? Plain Ridge is open, all right? And it's had virtually no impact on Twin River. All right. If you look at these charts, okay, this shows the revenue at Twin River, oh, gaming revenue, all right, each month, all right, for 2015 versus 2014. All right. For the first three months, July, August, and September, okay, Twin River's revenue was down slightly this year over preceding years. Yet October, November, and December, the three later months, okay, they actually are doing more business at, at, uh, at Twin Rivers than they did a year ago. The fact is they are not being impacted by Plain Ridge. And there's a reason for this. It's not that Penn is not a good operator, okay? The reason is simply that it is a slots only parlor, okay? They won't have, they don't have table games. They've spent about $250 million. We're gonna spend somewhere close to $700 million. We're gonna have a hotel, tables, totally different amenities. Uh, and the reality is, okay, that Plain Ridge has, has not stopped the people who are leaving this, the Commonwealth to go gamble in Rhode Island, nor is it picking up people in Rhode Island who wanna go into uh, Massachusetts, okay? Uh, I think this is an important factor. When we open uh, uh, in Brockton, all right, this will stop and people will stop going from, uh, from Massachusetts into Rhode Island because we're gonna have a nicer facility than Twin Rivers. Now let's talk about the impact on the Commonwealth in terms of tax revenue. The numbers I'm giving you come from the Innovation Group. Michael Saul is here. As you know, the Innovation Group is one of the leading firms in the business. They actually invented the uh, formulas by which you do uh, studies and represent many states and et cetera. Um, so all of these numbers are their numbers that I'm gonna give you. Um, uh, the projection is that assuming we're the only casino the, in Region C, all right, after cannibalization, after you subtract what the other casinos uh, will lose in business, okay, we, will, we will, are projected to, to generate an additional $71 million a year uh, in Brockton, which is new money going to the state, okay, plus you get a license fee up front of $85 million. I should point out that the cannibalization is not that material in the sense that any of the existing casinos that are operating in the Commonwealth will be in trouble. And, I, and you can look at that chart on page 34. There's no impact virtually at all on MGM. There's an impact on Penn, but they knew that was going to happen. And there's an impact on Wynn, but they're still going to do, uh, based on these projections of over $700 million of Wynn, uh, if we open. Our projection is we will do just over $400 million of business, assuming we're the only casino. And when I say our projection, this is the numbers from Innovation Group. Looking on the next slide, 35, at the annual gaming tax increase, um, you can see that where the uh, $71 million <coughs> net number comes from, we actually would generate about $101 million, but you will lose a little from each of the others, win the most, but of course they make far and away the most. So we net $71 million per year. Now let's move to the second scenario, which is that we are operating a casino, and so is uh, the tribe in Towton, okay? And let's go through the same analysis, all right? The first again is my e Econ 101, if you will. Do we have enough adult people in relationship to the number of gaming positions? Now the gaming positions have been increased 
because we take Wynn, we take Plain Ridge, Twin Rivers, Newport, Grand, and we add on a slew of positions uh, at Towton, okay? Uh, again, there are, more, there are more adults per gaming position with this addition in Brockton than there are in any of these other major markets, including Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and, Sh and Chicago, where we're operating very successful projects. There's 280 adults per gaming position when you put all those into this market. That's more than in Chicago, which has 224, okay? If you look at the, at the next slide, page 38, you'll again see why, why we will do well. Uh, we are 17 miles from Towton. That was critical, I mentioned at the very start, of why we selected this site. We knew we could survive if they had a casino. And you can see where we're located. We're closer to the big population base uh, coming out of south of Boston. Um, and we're 27 miles from Wynn and we're 27 miles by highway to Plain Ridge. So we, we're, we're very comfortable with our location. Now let's look at the impact uh, of a casino both in Brockton and Towton and how much money is the Commonwealth going to make, all right? The first premise is that you are always better off with a casino in Brockton, okay? Net of all the cannibalization, all right, if you have two casinos, okay, the Commonwealth will collect $40 million net per year. Now that's not as much as 71 if we're alone because they're no taxes being paid, but it's still more, okay, uh, than you would than uh, you now have. While a tribe would not share in the revenue, okay, uh, doesn't pay tax if we're there. Uh, we're still paying a 25 percent tax, and frankly, we're going to do much more business than Towton for the reasons you just saw. We're closer to the population base right off of the Route 24 by 17 miles. I also should point out, which is very significant, that the cannibalization impact on the other casinos in the state will be minimal just by adding a second casino. And it, logic would tell you that will happen and because if somebody's uh, going to lose business, uh, say from Wynn or from Plain Ridge, it's not going to matter that much if there's one casino or two. So there's very little additional cannibalization. You see that on page 40. Again, these are the numbers from the innovation group. If there are two casinos, instead of generating $404 million of revenue, we'll generate, we will generate $327 million of revenue. But at $327 million, we have a significant amount of EBITDA, or EBITDA, I should say, numbers which we've given you which substantially exceed $100 million a year. So this is going to be a very successful f casino for me uh, and for you and for the uh, citizens of Brockton. And frankly, if our numbers are off some, uh, if they're off $50 million, some number, uh, we will still be very successful, okay? Now, really the key is on page 41. This is the net from all the different scenarios of what your taxes will be, okay? If we're, al if we're alone, okay, the net taxes after cannibalization is $71 million a year. If you have two casinos here, okay, us and Totten, okay, you will have $40 million of net revenue, but you'll have 3,000 jobs, almost double the jobs because you have two casinos and double the economic benefit, all right? If you have Talton only and we don't have a license, you'll have 1,500 jobs, but you'll actually make less in revenue than you'll have if you have two casinos. The number is 33 million. And of course, you're not running the risk that maybe you don't have a Talton casino if you have two casinos or you award us a license. Obviously, if you don't award us a license and they don't build a casino in Talton, you've got zero. So the bottom line of the economics here is the Commonwealth earns more tax revenue if you give us a license. 
And that's true if Talton ultimately opens, or if they don't open, then you make even more. And as I said earlier, the Brockton Casino will be successful even if there's a tribal casino in Talton with 327 million of win, okay? And I should also point out that if there's two casinos here, Talton will be successful. They won't make as much revenue as they would have if we were, were not in the region, but they don't pay any taxes. So it isn't like Talton if you give us a license, that Talton isn't going to get a casino if it's ultimately determined that they can have one. And we're going to get to that issue in a minute. So there's a significant cost to the Commonwealth if a license is not awarded to us. And we think it's highly likely that a casino in Talton will be delayed many years and probably will never be allowed to open. So let me talk about that uh, for a few minutes, okay? What? Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to do this quickly and then call on the mayor. Or we can do the mayor now if he's running out of time. What? All right. So let me call on the mayor now because he has to go to a school board meeting, I believe. And then I'll finish my comments afterwards about the, uh, uh, the situation uh, in, uh, uh, in Tulsa. Mr. Chair, Commission, good evening, and uh, let me officially welcome you to Brockton, the City of Champions. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you on what this resort casino would mean for the residents of Brockton in the future of our city. We all know the numbers, a combined $12.5 million per year, plus over $10 million in infrastructure improvements, plus another $5 million in upfront payments to the city before the casino even opens. But my comments today are not about the numbers, but instead about what $140 million over the next 10 years means to the city of Brockton. Brockton is a gateway city, one of only nine minority majority cities in the state where our unemployment rate runs at about 150% of the state average and many of our residents are underemployed, particularly in our immigrant communities. Our economic development team is working to revitalize a manufacturing legacy city that has been down for the count for a while. We are no longer the shoe city. Blueprint for Brockton 2025, our 10-year economic development plan, identifies the Belmont Street corridor near the proposed resort casino site at the fairgrounds as an economic revitalization district. The plan calls for an entertainment district in that area anchored by a resort casino complex. The resort casino will not be on an island, but instead directly connected to the redevelopment of that area. When we talk about economic development, what we're really talking about is jobs. The creation of 1,800 good paying permanent jobs with benefits, not to mention the 2,000 union construction jobs during the build out. Our host community agreement contains a residency preference in hiring. So we know that the vast majority of these jobs will go to Brockton families. Jobs with a company who not just has a strong track record in hiring minorities and women, but a proven record of providing career and promotional opportunities to their minority and female employees. Think about the improved standard of living that comes with those jobs for Brockton families. But even more importantly, what those jobs mean to the futures of the children of those families. So let's talk a moment about those Brockton children. We have about 17,500 students in the Brockton Public Schools. 83% of our students receive a free or reduced lunch. 83% of our kids living at or below the federal poverty level. Over one third of our students are not proficient in English. More than half of our students go home to a household that does not speak English as its first language. And 18% of our students receive special education services above the state average. 
The Brockton schools also serve about 600 students who are classified as homeless. The transportation costs alone for those 600 homeless students mandated under McKinney Vento is nearly a million dollars per year. But out of Brockton's 600 homeless students, only about 200 were Brockton residents at the time they became homeless. Now make no mistake, we embrace the challenge of providing the additional needs and supports that these children require, and we welcome them with open arms. But there is no question that Brockton is bearing a disproportionate burden of the region's homelessness problem. Now those jobs going to Brockton residents will pump an estimated $60 million of payroll annually into Brockton's local economy. And couple that economic impact with the local purchasing requirement contained in the host community agreement that compels the resort casino to purchase goods and services locally. We are talking about priming the pump of Brockton's economy with tens of millions of dollars annually, spurring growth and creating private sector jobs. Now, the state's current Chapter 70 formula for local aid to education falls far short of the cost of meeting the needs of a Brockton public school system. Once again this year, our school budget alone faces a projected deficit in excess of $10 million, potentially causing over 100 additional teacher layoffs this year and the closing of at least one school. While most of our surrounding communities have level or declining student enrollments, Brockton's a gateway city. The Brockton schools have grown by 1,000 new students over the past four years, net gain of 1,000 students over the past four years. And casting a further shadow over the Brockton schools is the impending need for an overdue renovation or replacement of our 4,500 student, 43-year-old Brockton High School. A $300 million replacement is not likely, but at a minimum, we face a $100 million renovation and expansion of the existing high school. And even with a maximum state reimbursement of 80%, 80% that leaves a $20 million balance due to Brockton, money we don't have. The $12.5 million per year in annual revenue from a resort casino will allow us to increase local aid to an overcrowded, cash-strapped school system. Our host community agreement also includes a half million dollars per year for a community nonprofit, and we've designated the Brockton Education Foundation, a 501c3, that strives to fund the needs of our students that we're not able to fund through the school budget. That money will be used to pay for after-school sports, after-school enrichment in arts and music, support for the award-winning Brockton High Band and Brockton High Drama Club, and transportation for our sports teams. Now with 83% free and reduced lunch, that preempts us from charging user fees. But these opportunities for our Brockton children should be based upon their ability, not their ability to pay. No one better understands the challenges and budget shortfalls of our schools than our superintendent of schools, Kathleen Smith, who has gone on record as supporting the resort casino proposal. The development of the Brockton Resort Casino will also mean improved public safety for Brockton's residents. Currently, the Brockton Police Force has 184 police officers. However, the Department of Justice guidelines for police staffing for a city the size of Brockton calls for 250, 66 more than we currently have. A portion of the $12.5 million annual revenue from the casino will allow us to hire more police officers continuing to rebuild our police department. But additionally, the public safety mitigation agreement with the casino will directly fund the hiring of eight additional Brockton police officers, two additional school police officers, along with more school crossing guards, while also allowing us to invest public safety capital in a fire engine and additional police cruisers. Our mitigation agreement also calls for a $10.2 million investment in traffic infrastructure for pedestrian and traffic safety on the west side of Brockton, and I know you saw that illustrated earlier. 
Most of this investment will be in that Belmont Street corridor, identified by MassDOT as a high crash area, an area in which we've had two pedestrian fatalities within the past two years. This critical investment in safety infrastructure will be paid for by the casino developers with no taxpayer dollars. Now perhaps the biggest challenge facing the city of Brockton is to change the perception of our city. A destination resort casino surrounded by an entertainment district will transform the image of Brockton from a city to drive through to a city to drive to. And on a personal note, I think it's important for the commission to know that my son's family lives directly across the street from this proposed site at the Brockton Fairgrounds. In fact, in one of the closest residences to the project. And if I thought for one minute that this project would have a negative impact on the neighborhood, I would never support it right across the street from my grandchildren, no matter how much money it generated. The state has harmed Brockton in its revenue funding of both schools and municipal services, both in unrestricted state aid and Chapter 70 local aid to education. Let's not compound those two factors with a third by failing to issue a casino license for Region 3. Here are the facts. Governor Baker's proposed FY17 budget calls for $20.1 million in unrestricted local aid to Brockton. 16 years ago, in FY2001, that number was $26.79 million. Today, the city of Brockton receives $6.6 .6 million less in local aid than it did 16 years ago. And if we factor in inflation, the consumer price index over the last 16 years, the, uh, the true shortfall adjusted for inflation is $15.6 million. Had the state just continued local aid adjusted for inflation, our local aid today would be $15.6 million more than it is. The casino revenue for Brockton only partly makes up for that. Well, keep in mind, that's a one-year deficit, one-year loss that we've been sustaining for 16 years. But the casino revenue for Brockton only partly makes up for that, but nonetheless, it's desperately needed. Today, the city faces the need to find more than $23 million in new revenues or spending cuts to maintain level services to city and schools from FY16 to FY17. And think about that $23 million shortfall compared to the shortfall in, in local aid over the last 16 years. It's clear how much of Brockton's budget problems derive from state decisions. It's also clear how important a casino award with $12.5 million per year in new revenues would mean to Brockton in the future. A decision to award the Regency license would help to offset in part the fiscal damage done by other state decisions. There is no good reason to hold off on awarding the Regency license to a private company willing to put up its own capital at risk to the benefit of both the state and the city of Brockton. So respectfully, I strongly urge the Gaming Commission to issue the Regency license without further delay. The application period is now extended past a year. And whether or not there may someday be an Indian casino in Taunton, after years of legal challenges, should not be a factor in determining mass gaming and entertainment suitability for the Regency license. It's time to start generating the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue that is desperately needed by both the Commonwealth and the city. Thank you. Mr. Bloom, I know you have some more to go, but if you can just be as, as quick as you can. Uh, we had no idea that this was going to go on this long, so. Okay, this is going to be quick. Okay. Uh, this is a hard act to follow the, the mayor, and uh, I certainly appreciate the tremendous need that the city has. I just wanted to address the situation uh, involving uh, the lawsuit that's been filed. 
as you know, a group of citizens in Towton, long opposed to having a reservation in their community, have brought suit to challenge the Department of Interior's decision to put land in trust. Their case is exceptionally strong by any measure of legal review. We've talked to a lot of attorneys who are experts in this field. All right, each expert in Indian law agrees that the Department of Interior's decision is unprecedented, contrary to law, and violates the 2009 Carcieri Supreme Court case, which held that the Narragansett Indians in Rhode Island could not get land in trust. The citizens group asked us to help fund their lawsuit, and after looking at the law, and I'm not a lawyer anymore, but uh, I frankly was astonished, as have others, in looking at what the Department of Interior has done. And we decided to participate in the funding uh, of the suit that they brought. While there are many legal and factual errors in the Department of Interior's grant of land and trust in Taunton, the Department ignored the plain language of the statute as interpreted by the Supreme Court in the Carcieri case. The department effectively recognized that the tribe was not under federal jurisdiction in 1934. That's the key requirement of the Supreme Court's Carcieri case, and the department basically recognized that. That's required in the Carcieri case. But they then tortured the language in the statute to justify an unprecedented decision which took over five years for the department to make, okay? Basically, the department ignored the reference to quote such members in the statute that necessarily meant only members of a tribe that was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. I urge all of you to look at the materials that we have sent to you, which included a letter from us, a memo from our uh, lawyer, our Indian uh, gaming, our Indian lawyer, uh, David Tennant, uh, and I think you have a copy of the complaint as well. Um, you don't have to be a legal expert to look at the language of that statute and scratch your head and ask how they came to that conclusion. The effect of the lawsuit is that we expect there will be many years of litigation, five or 10 or even more years, before it can be decided whether or not the land can legally be put into trust. Now, it's, this is an important point to note. We know of no situation where financing has been obtained when a court challenge was pending to the Department of Interior's decision to put land in trust until a federal court had ruled in favor of the tribe. The present situation is the strongest challenge that we know of to the Department of Interior's unprecedented interpretation of the statute. In the current situation, with such a weak case for putting land in trust, we don't believe that any rational company would ultimately fund a $500 million project before this matter was resolved in court. It would not be prudent to risk your entire investment, which would be lost if it were ultimately determined that the land cannot be put in, into trust. Certainly no construction lender would take that risk. It's important to bear in mind that if it's determined that the land cannot be put in trust, this is a binary decision. And in substance, any investment by lender or equity would be worthless if a casino could not be built and you put money into it. So I ask yourself, if you were a bank, a financial institution, would you make a loan? Or if you were an equity partner, would you risk 500 million of equity or a loan guarantee prior to this matter being resolved it is not a sensible risk reward. Someone might say that they're gonna fund this, but will they really do it? If that person has the financial resources to put into this project before this is unknown, uh, I don't think they would do it. And if they have the money, they're smart business people, and I don't think it's a smart investment to take this gamble. Uh, for the limited rewards when you could end up with nothing. So the bottom line of it is, uh, we think that at least will be many years before a tribal casino can be built. 
and in all likelihood, a tribal casino will probably never be built in Taunton because this land should not have been put in trust. Um, so that basically concludes our remarks. I just want to make a couple of uh, last uh, statements, which will be very short. Uh, in conclusion, awarding a license in Brocklin, you've already heard, will create money desperately needed uh, for the town of Brockton and surrounding communities who, by the way, we have agreements with all nine communities now. Very likely that the development of the tribal casino will be delayed for many years and perhaps never open. The Gaming Act and the Tribal Compact each contemplated the possibility of two casinos in Region C. And as I pointed out, the Commonwealth earns more revenue with a commercial casino in Brockton or with two casinos uh, than with uh, Towton alone. With both Brockton and Towton having casinos, jobs are almost doubled and e economic development increases. But if you don't award a, a, a casino and a license in Brockton and the tribal casino never opens, the Commonwealth will lose $700 million over 10 years, all the benefits and jobs, et cetera. Again, if you award us a license in Brockton, the tribe will still have a casino if it's ultimately determined that it was legal to do so in the federal courts. And it will it be a successful casino because, frankly, we've run the numbers, and I don't know if they're better off paying no tax or paying 17% tax uh, when they're all alone. But uh, they will do fine paying no tax. And as I mentioned earlier, we're confident that the Brockton Casino, uh, with two casinos, will be successful. But not awarding a license to Brockton is going to put a dagger in the heart of Brockton and hurt the surrounding communities. And we can open in the spring of 2019 or possibly sooner. But the bottom line is it's a big gamble if you don't give this license to Brockton because you'll hurt Brockton so badly and at the same time, all right, you're running a risk that there'll be no casino in Towton. And if that happens and you don't give us the license, the Commonwealth's going to lose over the next five years after we open roughly $500 million, including a license fee. You're talking about a big gamble, losing a lot of money, and really hurting a city that needs it. And if the Indian tribe ultimately is allowed to have the land and trust, they will have a, a successful casino. So uh, we urge you to seriously consider, as I know you will, uh, and issue us the license. And I urge you to ask your experts and look at the statute yourself and the materials we've given you. And you look at that language. And you, you are all intelligent people. And you'll scratch your head, I'm convinced, and say, I don't know that this thing can stand up at all. It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you for listening to us and uh, hearing the presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Bloom. Thank you for the rest of the uh, representatives from the applicant. It's been two hours. We're going to take about a five-minute break and we will come back uh, with um, other elected officials. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to reconvene. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. For the record, I am Ward 1 City Councilor Timothy Cruz. I'm also the president of the City Council. Uh, the important thing being Ward 1 City Council because the fairgrounds is in Ward 1. I am the, the city councilor from the area, and I want to say that I am here to, to beg you to approve this license. We, uh, I don't know that we can wait, wait much longer. I don't have a prepared speech like the mayor did, but uh, I, I, uh, I, I live about 400 yards from the fairgrounds, and if anybody would be against it, it would be me and my family, and we are very excited for the opportunity to have this come to the city. Uh, and I can tell you that it's not just about the, the mitigation dollars, the dollars we can get up front, although that is huge. As we're preparing this year's budget, again, your commission is in charge with it, but we as a city have taken a lot of things on the chin from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the last 20 years. We educate people that 
aren't from Brockton, and we don't get full reimbursement for that. We, uh, the, the governor's new budget is going to crucify our schools if it goes through as it is. This is an opportunity for you as a committee, as a commission, to uh, help cities like Brockton, which is really what this legislation was about. I think you will find that a lot of the people you'll have testify later that are, that are against this are against gambling in general, which I, I respect. So, you know, there are people who, who do have an issue with that. However, that's not what this commission is charged with. The legislature voted to approve this. The people of Massachusetts voted to approve this. The people of Brockton voted to approve this. Those questions are, are done. So those votes, have, those votes have all been done. And again, some people might say I see in the paper every now and then the election was fairly close. Well, as I joke with city councilors who have won by five votes before, you know, you call somebody who wins an election by a vote, you call them councilor. So the election, there was nothing in the uh, legislation that said that you had to win by a plurality or by 65% or by 70%. The election was held in Brockton, and the people of Brockton voted yes on this. And again... And again. All right, folks, please. Let's just, let's, excuse me, sir, would you please be quiet? Thank you. Thank you. Excuse Thank you. I'm speaking to both sides. Let's please keep this down. We're not going to be here all night as it is. And again, I'll be much shorter. I'm, I, I don't have a lot more to say other than I, I agree completely with the, the idea that your commission has been charged with giving out the, these casino licenses. Every day that goes by is more money that the Commonwealth and the city and the area towns all lose out on. Um, clearly, with the court case against the Wynn uh, Casino, that could be another year before it even starts looking at permits. Springfield has already started to make changes and has been pushed back, I believe, a year. This project is ready to go. I've been a city councilor for over 10 years, and I've been very involved before that in, in much of the, uh, what's going on in this city. We try to attract businesses that we can. I don't have any other businesses come to Brockton looking to invest $700 million. The last good piece of property, one of the last really good piece of properties in the city is the fairgrounds. It's a historic piece of property, but the fair itself has, has fairly, pretty much run its course. It's time to move that piece of property, privately owned piece of property, forward. This is a great opportunity to do that. Some of the other items that have come up, uh, Belmont Street in my ward is one of the most dangerous streets in the state. We need to fix it. It's a state road. They don't have the money to fix it. We don't have the money to fix it. The only way I'm going to be able to get that road fixed is with the money that's coming from the developer, who clearly wants that fixed because he doesn't want tra tra traffic is something that my constituents are concerned about. I understand that. But uh, the people that will want to make sure there's no traffic issues are the people that want to get their customers off the highway and into the uh, casino quicker and out quicker. They don't want traffic. So they're gonna, they've already worked with us, and we have, I've seen good plans to move that traffic in and out safely. So those are the items that I can't fix on my own in, in this city, and this is one of our last best chances to move the city of Brockton forward. I currently have three hotels in this city that are 100% full. The problem is they're 100% full with homeless families put here by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that we educate and sometimes get partial reimbursement about two years, year and a half later. This is an opportunity to have people want to come to Brockton, want to stay in those hotels and a new resort hotel. So again, it's not just about the money that we can get short term, it's about changing the image of the city I grew, I grew up in. I want people to want to come to Brockton again. We are the only city on the South Shore uh, and uh, the largest city on the South Shore. I grew up as a kid where Brockton was the place to be. Certainly 100 years ago, we were the shoe city. We were the, one of the lead cities in, in New England, and we were famous around the world. I want to be famous for the right things again. I want people to want to come to my city again. If you approve this license, I believe this project can be, will almost certainly be the first casino open in the state, uh, again, uh, other than a, a slots parlor, and, uh, which is not a full-service casino. Again, respectfully, I don't think it's your worry about competition, really not your decision to make. A private, private business has made a decision that they can 
even if the Indian casino moves forward, that they clearly believe they can make money. They're not going to invest $700 million if they don't believe they can make money. So again, uh, hesitation on your part about oversaturation and that kind of thing, I think that's really not in your ken. I think it's, I think it's something that private industry makes that decision, and they've made that decision. They're here, they've spent money, and they're ready to spend $700 million in my city. And again, to make it a city where people want to come to. I envision, you know, within a year or two of a casino being open, somebody building a nice restaurant over where the Staples is right now. And instead of empty plazas on Belmont Street and other places, I have restaurants and other things, theaters that people want to come to. So please, I, I ask you, I beg you to approve this and approve it quickly because the state is losing out also. At this point, we have no money coming in from casinos. The legislature again approved it, the people of Massachusetts approved it, and the people of Brockton approved it. So please grant the license and please grant it quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Mike Brady. Senator. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to the board for allowing us to speak. I'm the state senator from the area. And as I mentioned from my colleague, the city council, this was on the ballot. The voters have voted in, in Brockton, voted in favor of this. Uh, I think some of the concerns with traffic issues, we, we have put money through the state funding budget on bonding bills and transportation, but there is not enough money to fix the roads and infrastructure in our city. The revenue from this proposed casino will help bring revenue into our community. Brockton's troubles are much like any other gateway city in the Commonwealth. Its tax revenues have habitually failed to keep pace with expenses to run the operations of government in the Commonwealth and the city. Employee benefit costs and all costs to run the operations of the city are gobbling up every dollar in sight. And our unfunded pensions and health care costs have gone through the roof. And our tax revenue is not meeting the needs that we need in the city of Brockton. We're in desperate need of more public safety personnel, more police and firefighters, and more importantly, more than anything, is jobs. The jobs that this casino will provide will help to put people back to work, and I've had tremendous calls from residents all across the area that want to go back to work. And the revenue, over $10 million that the city will receive from this, and the state, over $100 million in taxes, are much needed to operate the state in the city of Brockton, in which we need to operate our budget and to keep things operating in a timely manner. Uh, when I first got elected into the state house over eight years ago, we were facing a deficit. We seem to come above that and everything else. And this year, the governor's proposal, we're facing severe deficit, budget deficits. And we desperately need the revenue. We need the jobs. And as a city council who used to represent the area near the fairgrounds, I used to get complaints from different events that would go on there late at night. This will be an enclosed facility. And any time I've worked with the owners and the operators of the fairgrounds, any complaints I did get, they were answered in a timely manner and addressed. And I, um, but the, the noise and so forth, that, this will be an enclosed facility, so we won't get the noise that there was concerns years ago from other things operating in this area. And in, I don't want to be repetitive, um, as the Thank city council that. mentioned, but um, you know, this was on the ballot. The voters voted it for it, and uh, we need, desperately need the revenue and the jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any representatives of surrounding communities who wanted to speak? Nope. Hi. Could you identify yourself, please? My name is Jack Lally. I'm a city councilor. Um, I have to say, from, this from is Brockton? A, from Brockton. From oh, Brockton, okay. at Ward 6. So, sorry, say, some, say your name again. Jack Lally. Lally. Yep. This was a, uh, a tough decision to come to, you know, based on, you know, I had, I had to really look at both sides <clears throat> carefully, but I, I have to say I am in favor of the casino coming to Brockton. The... The, the, uh, the city is in desperate, desperate need for increased investment and increased revenue. And something like this could turn around the entire area and start to really help Brockton. The, the way we've, we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at some really, really tough decisions coming up when it comes to budgeting. 
I've been, I've been a counselor for eight weeks. I'm 19 years old, and I already know this isn't going to be pretty. When I was in high school, I had my own car. If I, if I chose, I could have driven to a casino out of state. They might not have let me in. And they, they wouldn't let, I don't think they'd let a, someone underage go into, the, go into the casino in Brockton. Just because there's a school nearby doesn't mean that it's suddenly be going, going to become the place high schoolers hang out. We need the money. I, am, I implore you to please give us this casino because we are, we're, in a, we're in a desperate situation it will help us out tremendously, and without it, we will we will be in some some steeper financial troubles. Thank you. Thank you. Representatives of surrounding communities, I believe there are none. Representatives of impacted live entertainment venues, I believe there are none. Then we will move on to a representative from Stand Up for Brockton. Uh, good evening, Commissioners, Mr. Chairman. My name is Fred McDermott. I'm an attorney, local attorney, Brockton attorney. I'm representing Stand Up for Brockton, and I'm also here on behalf of BIC, Brockton Interfaith Community. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Richard Reed, who's the pastor of the North Baptist Church in Brockton, and he's gonna speak on behalf of Stand Up for Brockton. Thank you. Did we get a remote that's working? Did we get the clicker that's working or? We'll get it. Thank you. Commissioners, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you today some of the concerns of Stand Up for Brockton and at least 50% of the population of Brockton. The harsh reality is that Brockton is going through hard times right now. And the leadership, we appreciate the fact that they are looking for solutions. They were elected to find solutions. Now there are supposed quick fixes, and then there are those long-term strategies. Reality reveals that quick fixes never last and are often harmful to a community. We implore you to follow what we of uh, Stand Up for Brockton would call a biblical principle of counting the cost. <clears throat> Our goal really would be that there be no casino whatsoever in Region C, but there is a reality that there is going to be one, at least one here in this area. The vote on May 12th, we acknowledge. We were short by 148 votes. But that yes vote did, not reve it did reveal a great divide in the city, and it certainly was not an overwhelming victory. When you look at what happened, $1.6 million spent against $3,627. I stand amazed that actually it was that close. Recently, uh, someone did a poll, a, phone, a random phone poll of people in Brockton, and it too is very close. The results were, I believe, 255 people said, uh, I'm neither for or against or refuse to answer. 700 voted and said that I'm for a casino, and 784 said no casino whatsoever. So it's still a very close thing. It is a divided city. The promise of $10 million a year is a lot of money. I wish somebody would give me $10 million a year to work with. It would be wonderful for our church and for any of the churches in our community. But for Brockton, that's just enough to cover at the current budget rate, 10 days of operations. The reality is it's not gonna provide any relief to our current budget problems in our city. It's gonna be spent primarily on policing and other issues that are related to that immediate area 
of where the casino has been proposed. We, we say, show me the money, and we know that the agreement says that 80% of the pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes, uh, in other words, pay, instead of real property and real estate taxes, it's part of this $10 million, and it is going to be used all up. There's going to be nothing left over, and again, it's going to be concentrating, taking care of services in that immediate area. The city of Brockton is also required to find a better water supply or additional water supply. And adding an enterprise um, the size of this proposed casino, according to their documents, would say they use 120,000 gallons per day and generate 110,000 gallons per day of wastewater. We have no remedy for this. Can our system currently handle this? You know, we have a real problem with our water system in Brockton, and the, and the casino is certainly not going to help it. Uh, we have an aging water system. Pipes are breaking on a regular basis, and, and last year we went through a couple days without any water here. Um, right now, the northernmost city or street in Brockton, Berkside Ave, it has relatively low water pressure. I expect that should something in the middle of town taking 120,000 gallons a day, that's going to diminish down to a trickle. It's a real problem. The desalination plant, uh, the Taunton River plant, you know, it's not ready to meet the current needs of Brockton. This is a, some, you know, an issue completely aside really from the casino, but it's preparing Brockton for recovery. And this may or may not be the solution. Uh, that's for others to decide. We do have a serious addiction problem here in Brockton, as many communities in Massachusetts do. Uh, one of the best quotes I heard on this was by Peter Katzis on WGB radio, who said, we would never negotiate with a heroin provider how much addiction he can bring into a community. Why would we negotiate the same with a casino? Uh, again, pointing out the fact that there are ramifications for a decision of this nature. There are problems that do come. Yes, all the numbers that have been um, placed before us today, uh, they sound impressive, all the extra money and all that, but what happens with families and individuals in our communities? There is a cost. The Mass Gaming Law allows for three Category 1 casinos in Massachusetts, Everett, Springfield, and Taunton. The Mashpee Tribe has met the two conditions set forth in the 2013 Indian Accord. They already are the third casino in Massachusetts. Regardless of the lawsuits that are there, they can build at risk. The law simply says three, not four. Brockton is not eligible based upon these laws that are now in place. <clears throat> we know that uh, many of us here are against gambling altogether. Uh, there are many people who just don't want it where it's located. Uh, government gambling has always been a problem. It's really, it seems to be a failed government policy. Now, I don't know of any uh, government agency that refers to it as a policy, but that's really what it seems to be uh, for the layman to look at it. And it has caused problem for many American families. It's blatantly dishonest. And uh, it just starts with, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there and then it becomes a real problem. And when this problem uh, gets made worse for an individual, one of the things that we see, and I've observed even in, our, in Brockton already, is uh, places like churches and other nonprofits become a, a, the first line of defense. When somebody is going through a struggle, uh, whatever it be, one of the places they turn to is the church. I know I get calls every single year people looking for additional food. This past year, it was for rent and mortgage money. Uh, their needs are not being met. Do these folks need jobs? Yes, but is this the place to do it? Um, again, gambling has failed to deliver. It often is promised that it's going to solve the problems. Uh, the problems of Brockton are many. They need solutions, uh, but is this the best way to do it? Do the casinos really deliver on what they're saying on paper or slide even today? It's failed because it's financially damaging to the citizens. 
it increases the divide between the powerful few and everyone else. Uh, predatory gambling is a real problem, and it's happening in more and more communities as they continue to expand. The target is the wallet, and it is the low income. It is the senior citizens, it's the minorities, those, those that can least afford this is the target market. Many people have some ideas of what they are selling us today about what the reality is, but I would classify them as you know, lies that have been told, you know, that commercial gambling creates jobs. Uh, no great nation or state has ever built prosperity on the foundations of personal debt, addiction, and the steady expansion of businesses that milk the existing wealth instead of producing new wealth. We need jobs in Brockton. There's nobody that will argue that. We're all in favor of new jobs, but jobs that will create <coughs> income, will create wealth and stability in our community, not draw from what already exists. <clears throat> that casinos improve government budgets, yes, it's impressive. Whether it's $40 million or $71 million a year, that sounds great. But the reality is when we look at other um, states, that has not really been delivered. California being one of the perfect examples of that it was supposed to fund the public education. In reality, it only provides 1.3% of their budget. Do we want to go to Rhode Island? I like going to Rhode Island, not to the casinos, but for other things. People say, uh, you're going to gamble, you're going to go out of state, so let's keep the money here. Uh, again, it's not really a valid argument. What we're going to end up here is not necessarily a destination casino, mm -hmm. but one that is a convenience casino. Most of the people that will come to it would be ones that are in our immediate area, in those areas that need help the most right now. So going out of state is um, really, it's a deliberate um, public relation tactic to avoid the intense scrutiny of what really happens in a community. The, uh, the slot machines, again, we have the Plain Ridge Casino now, and uh, you know, not a category one, but there are claims out there that say, well, these don't addict people. They do, and they're designed to draw everything out. I remember a number of times working in computer conventions out in Vegas, and leaving my little hotel room, uh, the hotel I was staying in was a small one where I didn't expect to find a casino, and when I would leave at 7 a.m. to go over the convention center to work my booth, there would be this group of people that would be at these slots, and when I come back 14 hours later, the same ones are there. It is addicting, and it is something we don't need. We have a big enough addiction problem in Brockton. Let's not add to it. Uh, the casinos, and I lumped in here lotteries, uh, they're not like any other business. A restaurateur will eat his own food. We put in here, someone with a vineyard will drink the wine that he makes. A movie actress will watch the movies she makes. This is the only product or service where most of the people who own it and promote it, including public officials, don't use it and don't even really want to live near it. it uh, the fact that it uh, diminishes organized crime uh, some studies out of Chicago said that that's not necessarily the case because the, uh, the criminal or the illegal uh, gambling facilities wants to get people used to uh, having uh, gambling on a regular basis. They pick up people simply because the risk is greater for the reward that they offer. Public opinion supports predatory gambling. Well. We look at the things that you don't want in your backyard, and number one is you don't want a landfill in your backyard. And casino is number two that you don't want in your backyard. And I've heard many people say that to me over the last year. We, we don't even care about a casino, we just don't want it in our backyard. The Brockton reality, and I'm using some of the original numbers that were given a year ago, the promise of 1,400 construction jobs, it sounds impressive. These will be union jobs, and that is fine. Our union workers need work. But most of the people that we're trying to address that need jobs in Brockton are not union members. These will go to those uh, outside of Brockton proper 
Uh, many of it will go to South Shore and, brought, and Boston area people, and yet some will have to be brought into our area. It's not going to help the need of the unemployed and underemployed in Brockton. The 1,500 plus long-term jobs, uh, you look at the numbers, not all of them are even near, nowhere near the $50,000 average that they're talking about. Many of these jobs are going to be filled by people that are already doing those same jobs in other places. I think of just a simple area of like the housekeeping. People are going to be hired because they have experience and they may be working at one of our city's other hotels now. And they will go over there because of a few extra dollars per hour. It will create some temporary jobs, which is good, but the reality is the likelihood is that many of these smaller hotels we have in town will ultimately be put out of business with this large hotel. The net, zero, net gain would be zero. Uh, we're a dust, want to be a destination resort? No. The reality is most of the people will be from this immediate area. That makes it a convenience casino. The location for any business we know is so important. But here, this one defies logic for me putting it next to the high school. Now, I understand there's 47 acres there ready for development, but a high school. This will be what I, could, what I was looking for, trying to find out if anyone else had done it. I cannot find another casino anywhere in the country that is built next to a high school. Someone said, well, we'll call Brockton Casino High. I don't know if it would ever get to that. I'm hoping that if they get their casino, that there will be uh, sufficient measures to keep those that are not eligible to come in there. But the reality and the perception is putting it next to a high school is not good for the image of Brockton. Is there any real economic recovery with a casino? The answer is no. We look at what's happening in Plain Ridge and you know, understanding it's simply a slot, it's a slots casino the numbers keep going down, and so much so that the Commonwealth has reduced the expectations by 40%. That is not good economics. <clears throat> Will it be delivered what was voted on here? We don't know. Springfield has scaled back. The Everett one is gonna go through many changes and maybe even more due to some of the litigation. Uh, we're not sure what's gonna happen there. But is that what the people voted on? Probably not. And of course, the reality here is, will the Taunton Casino happen? Uh, the predicted lawsuit came true, and uh, you know, Mr. Bloom and his team, they are partially funding it, and he explained that well earlier, and I understand where he's coming from. But the reality is, it's not against the casino, it's against the recognition of an Indian tribe, and it's a very special tribe. It's the tribe that met the pilgrims, Amen. the first immigrants to this country. <laughs> Who are we to say that they're not an Indian tribe? Enhanced business opportunities here in Brockton. We need to have alternatives. I said in my opening that you know we've elected our officials for this particular thing. Look for solutions. Opening up uh, Main Street to two-way again will help. Uh, enhancing uh, academic opportunities by expanding college and technical training facilities. This is a good thing for Brockton. Convert part of the fairgrounds uh, property into an indoor sporting facility. Uh, convert part of it to affordable housing units for starter families and senior housing, the people that need it most. Convert it into a sporting museum for the city of champions. And then one of the things that uh, I know is happening in a different part of the city is that an ethnic restaurant, restaurant area, starter restaurants, this is a perfect location for it. Yes, it is central. Yes, it is on a main thoroughfare. These are things that should be done. Someone uh, suggested to me yesterday to add something into this was uh, you know, a new uh, police, fire, and EMT center where it would be centrally located and easy access. Again, a good solution. Searching for more regional and national companies to come to relocate to Brockton. And I know many of our counselors are working on this thing even right now, but let's uh, kick it up a notch and partner with Boston and other regional healthcare facilities to improve what we already have here in Brockton. Make it so that we are truly 
a city of champions. The time is now for us to stand up for Brockton. Our choice, a short-term solution that comes with some long-term problems and a major disruption of family life and the community, or chart a new course with original and fiscally sound and beneficial to the community ideas and efforts. Commissioners, Stand Up for Brockton and the churches of Brockton are praying for you every day that God would grant you wisdom as you ponder the evidence and make a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Reed. Um, we have Shana Barnes, city councilor from Brockton. Good evening. Good evening. I, uh, I came in a little late, so I apologize for my tardiness and my sneakers, but I was out walking earlier. Um, I came in, like I said, I came in a little late, so I didn't hear the beginning of the presentation, but I did hear that uh, it was pretty lengthy uh, earlier, but I just, I guess I'm just standing to, first of all, just to note my opposition to this particular project in the city of Brockton. Um, <laughs> And uh, just to, not to rebut, but just to address from my perspective and my point of view some of the things that I heard uh, as I came in, in the door. Um, I, I particularly have, a, and I, I won't be long, I particularly have a problem as of late with all of these projects that, um, that have been presented to the city of Brockton for development and all of these things. And I'm really disappointed that we are coming off so desperate the desperation that we are showing as a city, uh, it's, it's abhorrent. And um, I think we need to, to take a little bit, take a step back and take a beat and not jump into everything that, we, that comes across a desk. Or not every idea is a good idea. We need to take a moment and make sure that what we do is something that can be beneficial and that can be sustained long term. And being desperate is when we get proposals like casinos and power plants and all these other kinds of things that foreseeably are bad, uh, bad projects. So I just have a problem. Um, we're not desperate. We are not, we're, we're in really tough times. We are definitely in tough times, but we are not desperate. Desperation is a, di is a whole different animal. And I think that if we also market our city in a more effective way and actually go out and pirate some of these businesses, and, and you know, when, when our administrator, our, our CEO of our city, when he goes to Washington, D.C. and Cape Verde, come back with some proposals for businesses there that can maybe expand and franchise here in Brockton. That's what we need to do. We need to go out and actively find these, uh, these projects and these businesses that are willing to invest in our city because we have a lot to offer. We don't market ourselves well, and that's why we're in these situations that we're in now and fighting in court and, and having um, um, conflict over contracts uh, from 20 years ago, that seven, eight, nine years up the road, all of a sudden it's a bad idea. So everything was a good idea at the time, but now when you see it and then some other things start to, to, start to shake out from it, it's all of a sudden it's a bad idea and then we get in these positions where we have to take these band-aids and we have to take these things because we get caught up. And, and I, I'm just really, I, I'm really passionate about this because I, I really am, I'm, I'm dismayed at how, um, how, how we, we appear. And, and I, I want to make sure that uh, we don't continue to go on this road that any and everything that wants to come to Brockton can just dump here and then either take off or do whatever they want to do because that's where we are now. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, you know, traditionally, if, if you take a look at some of the casinos and some of the other areas, Mohegan Sun, that was like the best thing since sliced bread when it first came around 10 years ago or whatever. Um, I, I mean, I mean um, Foxwoods. And then Mohegan Sun came. But traditionally, casinos report 
devastating revenue losses in the first three to five years of their operations. Look at Plainville. Plainville didn't even get a year, and they were about to close their doors two months ago. So we need to take a look at that as well. We don't have, I don't think we have the foundation to be able to support that, and I really don't think people are, people said people will come into Brockton to come to this casino. That's not what's gonna draw them there. That's not a family place to bring people. I, I agree with the Reverend when he said about um, the indoor arena, sports area, or even, that was a good idea about the, um, the sports memorabilia um, uh, museum. How about bringing some culture here? How about not bringing an industry that promotes having a cash check machine in the bathroom? How about that? How about we do that? How about we promote it a little bit better? Um, I was the only, only counselor to come out against the, the proposal in the beginning, um, and, and I made sure that I, I did all my research. I attended every meeting, several of these gentlemen, I've, I've seen them, and, and ladies, I've seen them several times at the meetings. I went to, I tried to go to every single one that I could, and I did as much research as I could, and when Bic started to, uh, to get their campaign off the ground against the casino, I also went to that. So I wanted to make an informed choice for myself as a resident, as somebody who's gonna be living here, who has no real plans of leaving. I wanna make sure that as I continue to grow, and, and as I grow my future family, I hope, um, that, that I'll have something, I'll have a foundation, I'll have something that I can be proud of and I can say this is where we are, not, oh, that's, that, that's where that old casino was so that it looks like some of the other places that are dilapidated and that we haven't been able to fill. Um, casinos in general, uh, you know, uh, back up. So I'm pretty sure it was mentioned here earlier that uh, we have our challenges. We have our challenges here, and, it, and some of the challenges are, are getting worse. I, I get that, and you know, we're trying every single day, and myself and the other counselors, we, we're banging our heads trying to figure out what we can do as a corporation and as a, a, in cooperative partnership to make this city a little bit better. And um, we have our challenges, and we're white knuckling it. Why would we invite an industry with known foreseeable challenges into our city to just burden us more with some of the things that we, we're not even uh, accustomed to. Some of the things that casinos bring, and not all casinos are bad, I'm not against gambling. I'm, I'm not against the whole gambling thing. I buy a scratch ticket every once in a while. You know, everybody does. So I'm not against gambling, I'm just against it here. Um, but why would we, with, with the foreseeable problems that a casino brings, just in general, if you take a look at, not all, but mo most of them, why would we bring that here to further burden our system? We're looking at major layoffs, we're looking at school uh, deficits. We can't, we can't support that. And also, Brockton is not a casino industry. We're not a casino town. We're a manufacturing town. We, we, we're distributors. We distribute goods for people to take home and to do stuff with. Let's do that. Maybe let's start to look at Spark Street. Let's build Spark Street back up, and maybe we can start to have a, a, a mini um, industrial parkway or something so that we can start to attract all of these businesses that we're seeing that we can't attract. We can't attract them because we're not trying, and we need to start trying a little bit more, a little more fervor. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I was back there taking notes. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, okay, so again, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge, huge gambler, but I'm not against it. But, you know, I, I, I don't really know the odds or all that stuff, you know, the tables and all that, but everybody keeps saying, you know, the people of Brockton voted for it. Yes, a slight majority of the people voted for the casino, but not everybody voted for the casino. I being one, several people in here, uh, several, Tens of people are in here also did not vote against uh, vote for this particular project, and I would say I would be extremely cautious to wager a seven hundred million dollar project on the whim of one hundred and forty three people. That's what that that's what the the referendum went by. Uh, one hundred and forty three people. It's like 0 0.01 percent. So if you can't even get the people in your area to overwhelmingly support your idea, what makes you think that somebody outside is going to support this? Um, again, I, I respect the developers, I, I respect, you know, their business, they're ex extremely wildly successful, um, and, and, you know, I definitely wish them well in all their endeavors, but um, let's, let's, let's turn the page on this. What's on page two of this proposal? Like, like, let's, or not even this proposal, but what's your second proposal? What's the secondary one? What, is it something better, like, a, like a, again, a sports arena, or something that everybody can take advantage of? Not something that's exclusionary and that only people that either, you know, will leave with their pockets turned out, like, like oh boy on the, the thing there from Monopoly. Um, we don't want that, we can't afford that. We cannot afford to burden the people any further with something that is, for, like I said, foreseeably gonna be a problem here in the city. So I would just urge you um, to 
not uh, grant this particular license uh, for the city of Brockton, and um, no, that's my time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we are to um, an opportunity for representatives of the public to speak. Uh, there are about 70 names on this list, <laughs> times three minutes, that's 210 minutes. You would know how many hours that would be. Um, so we will start. You do have a right for three minutes. Um, but number one, let's please adhere to that. And number two, again, we said earlier on, we understand and appreciate the passion. We can feel the passion in the room on both sides of this issue. This is complicated. But rather than repeat and repeat and repeat the same things over and over again, if you can make your positions known, give us a chance to see you and, and hear your positions succinctly, and then maybe move on. Maybe we'll have a chance to get through everybody who'd like to speak tonight. I'm just going to go through the list starting from the top. Uh, Isabel Lopez. I'm going to read several names. Brittany Swiger or Swigger, Ethan Snow, Stephen Bernard. There are, if you can come up uh, and be in line, it'll save us some time. Isabel Lopez. Pardon. She left. Isabel Lopez, Brittany Swiger, Ethan Snow, Stephen Bernard. Isabel Lopez. I'm reading the statement for her. Okay. Um, my name is Luisa Serrano and I'll be reading on behalf of Isabel Lopez. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the Gaming Commission. My name is Isabel Lopez and I'm an organizer for the Brockton Interfaith Community. And I am here today to speak on behalf of the thousand residents that have voted no for the casino, as well as the thousands of members that attend big member con congregations and on behalf of the thousands of students that attend the Brockton High School. Since the beginning of last year, when we heard the public officials had decided to sign a contract for a casino here in Brockton, thousands of faith leaders started to call BIC to get involved in worrying about the devastating effects this could potentially cause to our city that already struggles with the highest percentage of violence and addiction. Throughout this year, BIC has been working with clergy area member and residents to make sure their voices were heard throughout the election and post-election. Parents who believe it is harmful and a threat to their children's future to allow a gambling casino across the streets from Brockton High School had no other res re resource than uh, to work to oppose this idea. We have heard from thousands, hundreds of Brockton High School students that their dignity has been violated and disrespected. Nowhere in this process there has been an attempt to make a reach out to them, to ask for their input, recommendations, or feedback. Putting a casino directly across the street from one of the country's largest high schools is absurd. Basically, you can do whatever because I don't matter. I am a citizen like anyone else in this city. I deserve to express my point. This is what the youth, the participating in the listening session, bit conducted over the summer aid. It will not be of the benefit to the people of Brockton the residents of surrounding communities or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to accept any deal or idea when you know the health, safety, and well-being of all people is at risk deteriorating their lives. People matter more than profits. Please do not issue a commercial casino license in Regency. Thank you, and this is on behalf of Isabel Lopez. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brittany Swiger. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Brittany Swiger. I'm a banquet server at the Rivers Casino in Pittsburgh. I've been there for four years. Um, it's owned by the same people, Rush Street Gaming, you know, that's trying to come into your town. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity um, to tell me and my coworkers' story. Um, just to, you know, show you a little bit of, tell you a little bit about how sometimes um, at the Rivers you could just be that, a number on your badge, a disposable employee. Like, a, a lot of good employees that I've seen gone or As a banquet server, um, we cater events from small meetings to big lavish parties. Uh, we serve food, drinks to guests. My coworkers and I also, um, when I had first started working there, we were washing uh, our own dishware without the proper equipment. Um, in the middle of events, it was pretty dangerous and not to mention it was unsanitary. Um, told management about it so many times. They told us they laughed. It was gonna cost $50,000 to put a new dish system in our banquet facility, so it was a joke. Um, they didn't do anything to fix it until, of course, you know, a coworker um, 
got stitches. She had to go to the hospital and she had to come back and she ended up working the rest of her shift. And, you know, it takes somebody to get injured to get safety on the job. Also in banquets, um, we have to fight to make sure that um, our, it's called a toke book. I get uh, 375 an hour plus my gratuity off of uh, parties. And that's off of the food and the uh, bar together, the gratuity. Put in my paycheck. Um, when I first started there, we were just getting paychecks every two weeks, and I wasn't, I had no idea how I was getting paid. I didn't know that if, if my numbers were right, there was no log, there was nothing to say, like, this is what you made on this day, or anything like that. Um, we got a group of workers actually together and marched, you know, to management, and we demanded a tote book that we wanted to know what we were making. Um, we had, um, a couple, you know, after we got the tote book and everything like that, and people were starting to check their hours, starting to check their tokes and things like that, there was um, discrepancies. People were working and not being paid for events. Um, that was that. We kept asking for, you know, gratuity records and things like that to this day. Sometimes they come in a little bit late. It is a business, a banquet business throughout the United States. People do file an employment. There was a, also a problem. Um, one of my coworkers had filed unemployment and you know it's a two week pay period there was uh, you know you can make a certain amount of money in one week and then the second week you may not have any work but the casino was uh, dividing that one week into the two weeks um, it's pretty frustrating sometimes not to know where your money's coming from especially when your manager does um, we're fighting for a fair process to organize for a while now we've had you know petition running that was a majority things like that um, and that's like the main reason, you know, I'm here. Like, we've been fighting for a fair process. We want to make our job, you know, a great, great job. And um, we want the accountability, you know, to be there at our job. And I worry that restaurant gaming will treat you like they've treated us. Thank you. Also, uh, Stephen Bernard, Larry Curtis, and John Marion. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ethan Snow. I'm with the New England Joint Board of Unite Here. We're a labor union uh, that represents about 10,000 workers in New England in the manufacturing and service industries, uh, including about 1,000 workers in and around Brockton. Um, nationally, Unite Here. Uh, represents about 100,000 casino workers, uh, making us the largest casino workers union in the world. Um, we oppose this casino proposal because of the atrocious labor record of the Chicago group that controls it. Wow. This Chicago group, called Rush Street Gaming, is holding back working families at the casinos they already operate. Sugar House in, Fal in Philadelphia, Rivers Casino in Pittsburgh, and Rivers Casino Des Plaines outside Chicago. As you know, Rush Street Gaming and Mass Gaming and Entertainment share three senior officers, the same chairman, the same CEO, and the same secretary treasurer. And Rush Street Gaming would operate the Brockton Casino if it's built. Uh, you heard from one of the casino workers today who bravely shared uh, some of her and her co-workers' stories with you. Um, but here's more of the Rush Street story. Turnover at Rivers Casino uh, Pittsburgh stood at 40% last fiscal year, double the rate of the Union Casino that is its nearest competitor. Sugar House Casino in Philadelphia pledged, quote, the, ble the best jobs in Philly. But workers there have complained of insecure jobs, understaffing, and a lack of basic respect on the job. Each existing Rush Street Casino in the U.S. has run anti-union campaigns. They've settled a total of 38 federal unfair labor practice charges rather than face administrative trials. Rivers Casino Pittsburgh broke federal labor law by illegally interfering with a union election through surveillance of union activity and preventing the distribution of union materials. And casino workers have reported harassment from their managers, including threats, surveillance, and other intimidation tactics. The major benefit of casinos that host committees, communities like Brockton get is permanent jobs. But at Rush Street Casinos, the job track record is marred by high turnover, low wages, poor benefits, and ongoing labor conflict. There will be a difference elsewhere in Massachusetts, 
Our experience as the Casino Workers Union shows that a real partnership is possible. Some casinos provide good union jobs where workers have a voice and where the wages and benefits are excellent. We have had long-term and cooperative relationships with the casino companies that will be operating in Springfield and in Everett. We are confident that those jobs will be family-sustaining jobs. Unlike those casinos, Rush Street Gaming has refused to agree to follow a fair process. Uh, we urge you to reject their proposal. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Stephen Bernard. I'm a lifelong resident of Brockton, and I'm also president of the local branch of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People. Do not be afraid of change. Be afraid of not changing. Socrates, a great philosopher, said that the secret to change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. We who are in favor fervently embrace change. We embrace opportunity and we embrace the positive. This is a one-time opportunity with far-reaching and significant economic stabilizing factors for the city of Brockton, the region, and for the people. The March, 13, the March 2013 Brockton racial profile reads white population 44.2%, the black population 39.4%, the Hispanic population 7.8%, other 3.2, two or more races, two, and American Indian 0.4%. Obviously, as spoken earlier, we are by now a majority minority city. From the Institute of Assets and Social Policy out of Brandeis University, an article of February 2013 entitled The Roots of Widening Racial Wealth Gap explaining the black-white economic divide, the key factors are, or the key findings are, tracing the same households over 25 years, the total wealth gap between white and African-American families nearly triples, increasing from 85,000 in 1984 to $236,500 in 2009. Two, the greatest drivers of the growing racial wealth gap are years of home ownership, household income, unemployment, which is much more prominent among African American families, a college education, uh, inheritance, financial supports by families of friends and uh, pre existing family wealth, and three, equal achievements such as income gains yield unequal wealth rewards for whites and African Americans. The unemployment rate for the state of Massachusetts is 4.7 percent. The unemployment rate for Brockton is 5.6. In the country, the United States unemployment rate is 5.5, with African Americans almost twice at 9.5 percent, while white unemployment uh, for the country is 4.6 percent. We're encouraged by the financial impact that the employment opportunities from this project will have on so many families. Brockton is where we live, where we learn, and where we work. We know that this commission takes into account the social policies shaping and opportunities when making the final decision. Remember the, remember the sitcom The Jeffersons? Mr. Bernard, I'm sorry. On CBS that aired in 1975 to 1985? It was the spinoff from All in the Family Mr. Bernard, with I'm Archie sorry. Bunker. Mr. Bernard, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, your time is up. You, you can submit your statement to us for the rest of your uh, rest of it if you want to. Mr. Thank Curtis, you. Larry Curtis. Thank you. We, we, we encourage you to pass this, uh, uh, this uh, license on to us. We finally need a piece of the pie. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to testify for um, a great city of uh, Champion City of Brockton. My name is Larry Curtis. I am a resident in the city of Brockton. I am a homeowner, and I am also a registered voter. 
Um, I like to characterize this process as kind of a 12 round championship battle, a battle that the city of Brockton is very, very famous for with our boxing history. In round one, we saw Mass Gaming Entertainment, city of Brockton, and Mr. Connie come together and propose the idea of developing a destination resort casino for the fairgrounds. That was a win for the city. Round two, that collaborative effort resulted in us into, uh, as the city of Brockton entering into a city host agreement, which then triggered a, a number of events over the course of the next several rounds. Round two, I would characterize as a win for the city of Brockton. Then we got into what became the, the pros and cons of a destination resort casino for the city. Both sides, for and against, spent several weeks over an eight-week period getting out their votes for and against the city in accordance to the Mass Gaming Commission's uh, uh, rules and regulations. Those rounds, rounds three, four, and five, were really a draw for the city. And round six, as we saw on May 12th, uh, basically ended up with a significant win for the city of Brockton and the residents who came out and said yes for Brockton in their support of a destination resort casino. Shortly after that vote, we saw a couple of losses happen in the city. We saw in round seven, the continued state and uh, local aid cuts that the city continues to uh, experience. We've heard them from the mayor er in earlier testimony. And we also had a significant blow below the belt when the state decided to cut any existing funding for our community college collaborative that was gonna be an anchor economic development in the downtown area of Brockton, a significant blow to our city. But then in November of 2015, in round nine, we saw a resounding vote of confidence in the re-election of our Mayor Carpenter and the direction that he's taken this city. And that election won 55 votes two years ago to over 1,700 votes in support of the mayor going forward. The city in turn had losses in round 10 and 11. In round 10, the Department of Education made a decision that it was going to allow charter schools to come into our city. That decision will cost this city probably $10 million going into fiscal year 2018. That is so much needed in our public education system. Round 11, we're a city that's known for self-inflicting ourselves. Front page of the paper this past week, let's sue each other again over the power plant and let's look at a $350 million development project that has been nine years in the making and waiting for some decision to made. It brings us to round 12. Why are we here tonight? We're here tonight because the city of Brockton, Rush Street Gaming, and the uh, Mass Gaming Entertainment are going to knock out this proposal once and for all. As commissioners, I hope that it's a unanimous decision on your part after you hear all the testimony. And I will take a 3-2 vote, though. Thank you. <laughs> also, Phil Griffin, Paul Landerholm. Yo, no, you're, you're up next. Um, John Marion, Phil Griffin, Paul Landerholm, Michael Gallarani. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I'm Brockton. My name is John Marion. I'm a lifelong resident of Brockton with my wife, Shorig. We've raised four remarkable children who have all attended Brockton Public Schools. I am the co-owner of a business in downtown Brockton with my brother, Paul, in a third-generation family company established in 1951, president of the Downtown Brockton Association and president of the 21st Century Corporation. I'm here to support Rush Street Gaming's application to build a resort casino in Brockton because this project will bring much-needed economic vitality to Brockton. These are very challenging times for my city. I've seen the city in the height of its prosperity and when business was bustling and people were visiting Brockton to shop and be entertained in the many movie theaters, ballrooms, bowling alleys, and our 150-year-old Brockton Fair. We're looking to regain this vitality and energy by bringing in business. Federal and state monies are drying up and cities like Brockton need to find creative solutions to generate revenues which are necessary for much needed infrastructure repairs and to maintain the services for our residents who have stayed loyal to this community. This resort complex is a creative solution. The hotel, restaurants, entertainment hall, and casino will be an entertainment option which will attract people to a new exciting city. It's an economic development project which will create 1,800 new jobs for the people who live here. 
The hotel and casino entertainment complex will generate $10 million that will help fund more police, more teachers, fix roads, and attract people into the city who can potentially spend money in our community. It will complement our economic development plan to rebuild our downtown, where we will be opening several more restaurants and continue to create a better quality of life for Brockton and the surrounding towns. In closing, Brockton's economic development future will continue to look for creative ways to generate new monies, which will rebuild our city. This entertainment casino resort will not only generate $10 million to the city, but expand our local economy through commerce created by buying goods and services that will generate additional millions to the local economy. For years, Brockton has been the recipient of every socially dependent problem, from homelessness to drug rehabilitation centers, but not the necessary funding to support the costs that burden our local services. Federal monies are scarce, and the governor has recently announced more cuts to an already underfunded budget. This is devastating to Brockton. Projects like the casino resort do not come along very often. It will create new jobs, generate new taxes, add dollars into our local economy by buying goods and services. It will give our city a reason to be proud again. What, may I ask, the commission is your answer. If I may be so bold, the answer is support this resort and let us create a new vibrant destiny for the city of Brockton. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Paul Landerholm. Uh, I'm a 30-year resident of Brockton. I'm also a local 7 iron worker. Uh, I'm strongly in support of this casino. I'd love to see some some benefits to Brockton. That I mean, what this will bring will be sorry. I'm not as good as speakers. All these other people before me, the dress and uh, I, I'm strong in support for it. We we need something here. I mean, we, we're not a staple of the shoe city anymore. We're a staple of other things in the news. So. Maybe a casino will bring a, you know, a different light to the city. Uh, that's it. That's all I got. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Thank you for coming to Brockton. My name's Phil Griffin. I lived in Brockton all my life. To really simplify this discussion, what this really boils down to is the economic future of Brockton. Brockton is in desperate need of jobs and revenue. I believe this casino would be a real impetus in providing a stimulus in the economy that Brockton needs. In the short term, to be plenty of jobs, a union tradesmen, to make good living wages for their families. In the long term, to be permanent jobs, 1,800 jobs. That's only the beginning of it. If a gentleman like Mr. Bloom was willing to invest almost $700 million, other entrepreneurs would come to Brockton and won't be hesitant to maybe invest a million, 500,000, or even 100,000. It will change the whole image of the downtown of Brockton and the city in general. I cannot urge you in any stronger way. The city of Brockton deserves better. It needs better jobs, a better economic future, and this could be the beginning of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gallerani, also Adriano Cabral, Dana Boardman, Jean Holmes. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Gallerani, and I think in the interest of time, I will just defer to the comments that Mr. Merrion, the president of the Brock to 21st Century Corporation, which I'm executive director of, made. I think I don't need to echo exactly what he said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you sir. Good evening. I'm Jean. Yes, Jean Holmes. Uh, good evening. First of all, I'm going to say I'm Ward 1. I know you heard from the Ward 1 counselor. Guess what? He doesn't speak for the neighbors. He doesn't speak for the residents in Ward 1. <laughs> I'm here speaking as a parent, as a taxpayer, and a resident who lives in the neighborhood of the proposed casino in Ward 1. I'm absolutely against the casino as proposed, and I urge you to deny the application for the casino in Brockton at this time. It's not the right place. It's not the right time. It's not the right applicant for the license. And I predict that awarding this license will ultimately cause grave harm to Brockton and to the surrounding communities as well as seriously embarrass the Gaming Commission. I know that many people have, brought the rhetoric spun, have bought the rhetoric spun by the applicants. Many of the people, Mr. Curtis is paid by Mr. Carney. I mean, all the people. I'm not paid by anybody. I'm just here on my own. But I have to say this. Not all that glitters is gold. Long, long ago, I had to go to uh, Reno with my daughter, who was doing a clinical rotation there. I'm sure this is just one example, but people need to know what the realities around a casino are, as opposed to what's been promoted and what has been advertised by this applicant. 
I went to Reno with my daughter, and I can tell you it was the most depressing weeks and the scariest of weeks that I ever endured. Reno has many casinos, but other than the bright lights of the casinos, the place is a mess. When I walked around, there was nothing but empty storefronts, pawn shops, panhandlers, vagrants, etc. I felt extremely unsafe as I walked the streets because other than the vagrants, I didn't see anyone. I presume the other people were inside the casinos or their houses. The evidence that it's not safe was quite evident in the buildings that I saw because the buildings in the homes around the casino area had bars on the windows. And the place where my daughter stayed had a 24-7 armed security guard along with key access to the building and the parking building. And I asked the building manager about her safety because I was going to be leaving her there. He advised that they were doing the best they could to protect the people that, attend, that went to their hotel. But the best thing was they couldn't really make sure she was safe. So she should make sure that she never ventured out alone as it would not be safe outside the secured walls of that building in the hotel in Reno. If that's not enough, I visited a pawn shop and I could not help but feel the pain and the suffering of items that were for sale that clearly belonged to some family member, a spouse, a parent at one time, were probably someone's fairly family heirlooms, but now they were being sold to strangers because the original owners had fallen victim to the lure of the casinos and the bright light. If this can happen in Reno, it can surely happen in Brockton. And even worse is that this will be right next to our schools and endanger our children. At least in Reno, the casinos weren't near the schools or near the children they, that were there. there. I, I ask for your indulgence, if I may, I'm almost finished. I would also point out that Mr. Bloom and Carney, they have pro provided us with lies and manipulations. I think that they have also come before you. I would point to the time of November 4th. Holmes, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. We're, you'll have to finish it. You can submit your comments to Just us quickly, I would say, oh, the tangled webs they weave. First, they practice to deceive. Please don't fall into their web, please. Thank you. Adriano Cabral, Dana Boardman, Christopher Lovatier, Allison Van Dam. Um, I'm Dana Boardman. Worked 38 years at the VA hospital on Belmont Street. Um, some of my concerns are the traffic that is a joke. The study you folks have received is full of <coughs> false hoods that a two-year-old knew how to read would find out that the day they picked to do that was on the first of all, February, the shortest month of the year, vacation times, and they picked a two hour time frame, which the traffic on that street is unbelievable. There's been accidents, fatalities, so you should really look at that study. The other thing is, there was a comparison between building and staying the same. Well, if you look at the statistics, when they had buildings, some of the traffic went down. Now, either it's a typing error or someone doesn't know how to do a very good study. Um, other things than the traffic is there, there has been fatalities. The owner got injured coming out of the fairgrounds himself. And the money that we're talking about, the state has not guaranteed they're going to put their portion up, which is the major areas. And I believe with the traffic studies and you increase at least 3% traffic, and then the narrow two-hour period they have, that traffic is from when school gets out till 6 o'clock at least. So people, when they come to Brockton, going to see this wonderful brick building, they will not come back because their lives are going to be in their hands going down 123. It's a four-lane highway that's too narrow, and there have been many fatalities there. Um, also, I'd like to share with you, and I'm, I'm upset at not having the two hours to talk that other people had to go over this, but I do have, you are supposed to have put on your website this five criteria. One of them is an overview. How's the applicant show his uniqueness to the industry? Beautiful brick buildings, but that site is historic. It has a world famous history of the fair. My great-grandfather would travel by train from Lynn to come here. Why isn't that been incorporated? Or City of Champions, Shoe City, why isn't there something showing a history there? They are just a new industry, they want a new, and they forget the history of Champions. We have historic sites that are not being built up because the leaders lack um, 
four to two. Why doesn't there a great Ferris wheel there to show off? Revenues, okay? Many people have talked about Taunton and they made this sound like Taunton is not going to matter. Well, I haven't heard him talk about it and I read this is going to be a casino in Tri Tiverton, just over the border. Talk about saturation, come on. The other quick thing is they don't talk about um, what's it going to do to the average person. Addiction goes up at least 1%. That would be a 1,000 families adding to our already fourth highest closure rate in the state. Mr. Boardman, excuse me. I'm sorry you're yeah. finished. Yeah. You I'm sorry the that uh, the opponents didn't get fair time to the, uh, the business. All right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alan Peralt. I've lived in Brockton for the last five years. The reason I came to Brockton is because I work for the Brockton Rocks baseball team, which will be right near the proposed casino. And Right now, it's only a seasonal job, so I, in order to uh, able to work, I've been able to only be able to get temporary jobs. And the last full-time job I ever had was I worked at Foxwoods Casino. Um, I mean, I was against gambling and all that, and I, you know, occasionally, you know, will go, but not. I I can go to Foxwoods right now and don't even gamble. But at the time, I had just got married. I wanted to start a family, and same thing. There was only temporary jobs. Foxwoods gave me a chance for a salary, benefits program. I mean, everything. So I was able to support my family. And that's why I looked at it as a job. And hopefully, I can do the same by living here again, staying here, and able to work full time again so I can be able to support my family. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher Lovatier, Allison Van Dam, Dr. Mark Oliver, Patricia Lawton. Good evening, sir. <clears throat> Ma'am, my name is Christopher Lovatier. I'm a professional magician. If anybody should have a personal desire to work at a casino, it would be me. Uh, if for no other reason, I would find great favor at your card tables. I'm sure I could take plenty home from me, but that won't happen, and I digress. I want to thank Mr. Crosby, Mr. Stebbins, Mr. Zaniga, Mr. McDonald, and Ms. Cameron for giving me time to speak about the grave threat that faces my family and my city. I am a Brockton resident. I have been for over 45 years. Minus the four years that I served in the United States Air Force defending and representing the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. My wife and I have raised five children. Three have graduated college. The remaining two will be freshmen at Brockton High School in September. Your stated mission is to create a fair, transparent, and participatory <laughs> process for implementing the expanded gaming law. In creating the process, part of your mission is to reduce to the maximum extent possible the potentially negative or unintended consequences. The commission has been clear that it will base its decision on whether we approve a commercial Regency casino on what it believes is the best interest of the Commonwealth. Your decision to accept the application by Mr. Bloom was based on your doubts about the Mashpee Indians being federally designated a reservation. The tribe did indeed receive that designation. A casino in Taunton, not Taunton, 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 does satisfy your stated mission. The discussion should be over. Why does it continue? Why does it continue when they come to you and threaten you with litigation? In August, that's what they did. I have the transcript. They threatened you with litigation if their proposal wasn't put forward. The discussion should be over. The Brockton Casino doesn't satisfy your mission statement. It hasn't been a fair process. 
an out-of-state billionaire should not be allowed to buy the results of a local election. By outspending the opposition by 600 to 1, with the single stroke of a pen, with a, a single check from this man, he was able to buy the support of former Mayor Jack Units. I'm Mr. sorry, Lovettier, I'm running out of time. I have it written. I will be finish quick. Finish it up. Okay, right I will. now. I will. I won't ramble. Uh, it isn't fair that we were only allowed three months to gather facts and have a healthy debate on the issue. It isn't transparent when the Brockton Fairgrounds has its designation changed from agricultural to commercial. Mr. Lovettier, I'm sorry. Without the, the input is, of the city the council. I gave four years! You were Thank only you. giving me three minutes! Sorry, I gave that's four years. Sir, 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 settle sorry. down. Settle down. Let me finish. You can submit, I you, let me finish. You can submit the paperwork to us. We have, we have your letter. Excuse me, sir. I think it's you time. You already heard that they repeated the same things I've heard it before. I think it's time for other speakers. Thank you. You denied my 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 rights. You have denied my rights. Allison Van Dam. I have family here. I'm from Brockton. Is that you? That's me. Good okay. evening. Thank you, uh, Chairman Crosby and Commissioners. Uh, so. It's important distinction in this project to note that it's a suburban casino. It's, it, it's not Reno. Brockton will never be a casino city. We are a city that hosts a suburban casino, hopefully. Uh, this represents a large economic opportunity, as we've heard of the investment from the mayor and how we plan to use that education, infrastructure, support. Uh, but not only that, it helps replace those 600 jobs that were lost with the closing of Raynham. Uh, dog track when the referendum vote changed with the, the dog racing. It also helped to bring back some of those $1.1 billion that is spent in Rhode Island and Connecticut in casino gambling. Uh, the largest patronage in uh, those casinos is from Massachusetts residents. So many may ask, how do we know that Rush Street Gaming can, uh, their claims that they are they can be confirmed. So our present CEO, Chris Cooney, visited Rivers Casino in Des Plaines, Illinois, which is a Rush Street uh, developed facility that is closest to the suburban model that we are looking to develop here. Uh, what he discovered confirmed the, the claims of the positive impact within the community. So Rivers Casino opened in 2011. It's near Chicago, much like we're near Boston. It's close to the highway. Uh, they get 10,000 visitors each day. The facility is well balanced within the uh, environment. It's not overbearing. It fits with what is going on around it. Uh, there are 10 other close by casinos. There are three of them within 30 miles. So we're talking about saturation of market. They have found that that is not a problem. There's plenty of business to go around in Illinois. Uh, they have partnered locally with the workforce training program in Chicago for to place homeless and at-risk families into jobs. In, in their uh, casino. They mentored hundreds, employed 26, and invested 200,000 through grant scholarships and sponsorships. Uh, the faith group based groups have actually supported the casino as well because they have provided financial aid, food, and volunteerism to, the, uh, to those different nonprofits. In fact, they gave 1.7 million in donations beyond the host agreement to the different communities. Uh, it helped to finance infrastructure roadway, uh, roadway reconstruction, through the casino taxes, uh, there was a new transformative drinking water project, which will also save a local water rate for the residents as well. It's outstanding food that has that's uh, established there, much like they're planning on doing here, that's attracted other restaurants. Uh, diversification of entertainment as well. There's a skydiving facility, indoor skydiving is open there, as well as ice skating. It's brought a lot of uh, development into the area for entertainment, diversification of industry. Uh, so we've seen a lot of progress in Brockton downtown with creative economy and development, so it would help us support a lot of that. Uh, they've proven that they are capable, stellar, well-vetted, well-financed, and they have a great track record of uh, casino development. So we can have a better partner, and they're likely to be the envy of other casinos within the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Oliver, Patricia Lawton, Fred McDermott, I think, has already spoken. Kelly Williams, Jean Morrow. Merrill, yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, my name is Mark Oliver, as I said. I am a pastor in this city, Trinity Baptist Church, um, but I also serve um, on Operation Divinity, which is a ride along with the police department, getting a chance to visit a lot of, a lot of situations, a lot of brokenness. 
I also am a co-founder of Rockton Christian Mentoring Initiative to try and respond to some of that brokenness in, in the homes. And in one of our ride-alongs, um, I did meet some young men, and one of the young men I now mentor, and I first want to start by just sharing with you the response of, of this 13-year-old who I have the privilege uh, to serve as a mentor for the last two years. And when he heard, as we were driving by the, the fairgrounds, when he heard that a casino was proposed for our city, the very first thing, the very first thing that he thought about was his father. And his dad works. He's not an unemployed, but his dad works. But he has some issues, including a bit of a gambling issue. And the very first thing this young man said is, oh, great. Oh, great. And I said, what do you mean by that? Because now I'll never see my dad. I will never see my dad. And the truth is, with all of the ride-alongs and the different things that I, do, I know uh, about in this city, that story will be repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. Now, secondly, I just wanted to say that it, it hurts me to think that, that we are easily dismissing the potential influence of a casino adjacent to our high school. It's been mentioned. And, and we know those who have put the application in, they say, uh, listen, uh, 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 location is everything. Well, we also know that proximity is influence. Proximity is influence. Um, that's the reason that, that, that people don't want things like bars and adult stores next to their children's schools and playgrounds. It's the, it's the very reason that we have zoning laws and, and all those kinds of things because we know proximity is, is influence. It's the reason that people move out of, of neighborhoods when drug activity gets, gets out of control. And, and it's like we're, we're pretending that that is not next to each other. We're pretending like it has no influence. Um, since proximity is influence, I'm asking you to supply us with the wisdom that our own vote on this issue didn't supply, to really think through it. Um, proximity is influence. Help us as a community to prevent an influence of our children that arguably is on the low end of a life direction instead of the more noble directions that will come from a good Brockton education. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Patricia Lawton. I was born in Brockton, and I've lived in the neighborhood of the fairgrounds in two apartments and two homes, and our family now has a business here on Belmont Street, about a mile from the fairgrounds. Every summer, we look forward to the Brockton Fair, as did my parents and grandparents. People came from all over the area to go to the fair. But times change, and so has the fair, and now is the opportunity for something else to take its place something that will continue to offer entertainment as the property has for 140 years. The casino is just part of the proposal. Let's not forget the 225 room hotel, the 25,000 square foot entertainment space, room for restaurants, and the development surrounding the fairgrounds that history tells us is sure to come with it. I would like to change the adverb to a preposition talking about Brockton, as in going past Brockton, to going to Brockton, as they did for 140 years, for fun and entertainment. This is what is at stake here. The perception that Brockton isn't a good place to go. We are a proud but tired old city, looking for a business of this size to give us the shot of adrenaline we need to spur other economic development to invest here. We haven't had that for a long time. The wrong lesson the development might teach young people is really lost on me. I see a lesson on job creation. I think the best thing we can do for a young person is to make sure their parents are employed or that they themselves have opportunities. Those same children are driven to school by their parents who stop at the convenience store to buy gas, Powerball tickets, and scratch tickets. At night, they dine with their parents at George's Cafe and eat pizza while their parents play Kino. One month ago, those same families bet on the Super Bowl, and I'm willing to bet, as the saying goes. This month, they're in their office pools betting in favor of Ohio State against Villanova. Gambling is all around us. I know there are some who moralize against the evils of gambling. May I point out that many of those who oppose the Brockton license have already publicly supported the grant of a federal license to the Wampanoags in Taunton, just 13 miles from where I'm standing. It's OK to bet in Taunton, but not here. Moral decisions are not made by commissions. This is a business decision. A business with a great track record wants to come to Brockton and bring with it money and jobs to help our city. 
We have always been known as the City of Champions. Some boxers have helped secure that title for us, and we are still fighting to keep that name. We are in the ring right now, and we need one more champion. We need you, the Commission, to grant us the license for this proposal. Give us one more round to foster economic growth and the potential to make this city once again a place people go to to be entertained and to be an even better place to work and raise a family. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening again, uh, Fred McDermott. I am a lifelong resident of Brockton. Uh, actually, I'm a third generation Brocktonian. I have a home here, I have a business here. You know, we've heard a lot of things about the desperation of Brockton. Unfortunately, there are a lot of older mill cities that need money. Uh, Chicopee, uh, you name it, Lawrence Lowell. You're not here to give people money. You're here to determine what's best in terms of this commission and casino. Region C already has a casino. It's in Taunton. End of story. There's three casinos in the state. If you contemplate a fourth, and maybe a fourth might have been contemplated, but that might be up for litigation too. Who knows? But did you really, could you possibly contemplate a fourth that was, as she said, 13 miles away from another casino? You can get on 24 now, and within 15 minutes, or if you drive like most people on 24 within 10 minutes, you can be to where that casino is going to be. Why would you want to put another casino 10 minutes away by car? Uh, Brockton does have problems, has a lot of problems, and it does need money. But certainly, you don't need to start cannibalizing casinos or permitting, permitting your way into a lawsuit by granting a fourth casino uh, by allowing Brockton to have one. I pay my state taxes, too. I want to make sure that each casino pays their state taxes. I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't want to miss, uh, wouldn't want to let the state miss that opportunity. And if Brockton has granted that, then that means that uh, the Taunton Casino pays no taxes. Uh, Brockton Casino is the wrong thing for the state, and it's the wrong thing for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, my name is Eugene Marrow. I'm a resident of Brockton. Um, I was born not too far from here, Brockton Hospital. I think it's one block away. Not only was I born here, but my mother and father were born at Brockton Hospital. And there were nine in my father's family and 12 in my mother's family. So we go quite a ways back. I have uh, just a couple of concerns. I'm very passionate about, I was an educator in the city of Brockton for 42 years. As a matter of fact, I taught at Brockton High School for 42 years and ended up the principal of Brockton High School. Now, I know they mentioned uh, about you know, this casino being so close to uh, Brockton High School, but I've also had the pleasure of working uh, with, uh, <clears throat> in, in a gambling uh, a, a place rain, called Rainham Park uh, for Mr. George Carney for over 20 years. And I can tell you in, that, in those 20 years and also at the Brockton Fair when they had the horse racing and Marshfield Fair and Weymouth Fair. And there's never been any problem with, uh, with students uh, involved in the gambling or, and what have you. And this casino that's going, you know, hopefully that's going to be built in Brockton is gonna be very secure. You know, Brockton High School students are not gonna be waltzing out of Brockton High School and waltzing over to the casino. Um, so I, I really don't, you know, and, and I'm very compassionate about Brockton education. And the reason that I am for the casino is, is that I, in the 42 years that I was an educator in Brockton, I have seen the educational system go through some very difficult times. I was here when they laid off 450 teachers, when we had 40 and 50 in a classroom. And it took us over 10 years, you know, to get back to normal. We are, we are now back in the throes of, of going back to that situation. Funding for the education has been, has been cut. Uh, you heard that there's a new charter school coming 
to the city of Brockton that the superintendent didn't want, the mayor didn't want, the city council didn't want, the school committee didn't want, and we didn't need it. We are, this urban city of Brockton is the best urban city in Massachusetts when it comes to education. And you can look it up. We have, we have made great strides in, 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 in bringing up our MCAS scores and, and all of that. We, they should have never allowed, first of all, the charter schools to come to Brockton. We are not in the lowest 10%. So I urge you, I, I, was that my signal to leave? Yeah, that was leave? Signal. Okay. Uh, I, I just, want you, just want you to know that, uh, uh, that I, I'm passionate about the education in Brockton, and I think that the casino will help us in that endeavor. Thank, Thank you. you. Kelly Williams, Bishop Te Te Texana, Tishana, uh, Vivian, Viviana Sapien. Yes, ma'am. Hello, thank you for allowing me the honor uh, to speak here tonight on behalf of Rush Street Gaming. Uh, personally, I want to tell you that my husband and I have lived in the Northern Liberties Fishtown area, lived and worked for over 20 years. And to see the renaissance of our neighborhood and the surrounding areas is just uh, so overwhelming and makes us so proud in the new businesses and the restaurants and the bars and the parks and the dog parks and the sidewalks and trees um, and the waterfront that we've always wanted to be developed is so beautiful now and it brings us such pride to be a part of it. Now I work there. Uh, one of my jobs at Sugar House is to facilitate new hire orientation and one day in class uh, a new hire stood up and he said I would love to share my story and he said Kelly I have lived in this area uh, born and raised and now I have three little boys and a little girl and since they were old enough to play baseball I've been a little league coach and he said for years on Saturday they've been playing on a, a brown dirt lot where they've made their bases out of cardboard boxes and sometimes even his sweatshirt and he said until Sugar House donated tens of thousands of dollars to this park and now they have this official baseball field along with a, a, a playground and a parking lot. And he stood up in class and he said, Kelly, I have to tell you, I, I feel so much gratitude to Sugar House, the fact that somebody cared about our neighborhood and our children enough to invest in this little league that now there, there's hundreds of little kids playing baseball. Now they have this beautiful field that they're proud of. And when he told me that story, it prompted me to talk to the VP of communications. And I said, tell me more about our community involvement because I'm excited, I'm so proud, I need to know more about this. And she said, Kelly, from day one of opening, we committed ourselves to knowing our neighbors, to donating to causes and organizations that are important to the neighborhood and to the city of Philadelphia. And we at Sugar House have donated over $7 million, $7 million to the local communities. It's, it just makes me so proud that I could speak here on behalf of that. And we have a continued commitment to support those efforts. I love working for Sugar House and I am so proud to work for Rush Street Gaming because I know that we are a part of something greater for our team members and for the city of Philadelphia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bloom, um, unfortunately black lives and brown lives in this country, in this state, this city does have the same opportunity you had in your life to be a millionaire. Last Tuesday, I spent six hours at Shirley Medium Jail, talk about Black History Month. And I had at least over 200 inmates in front of me. And a good number of them were young men from Brockton. Haitians, Caverians, Latinos, and Black American. If we do care about the education, as I do, as I drive, as I go to the Bishop, jails of Massachusetts. You should speak to us, please. Well, I'm speaking to you, but yeah. also want the audience to, to listen. Through us, the that's the right. pain of what we can build in this nation when people want to come and impose their power, their, their illness of money on the poor people. Brockton, yes, is a poor city, not by choice, by the leaders we have in Brockton. Yes, we look gray, we look scared. 
because the corruptions of the city leaders of Broughton. And you hear, this is the baby of mayors who came through this city. Jack units and others. And they stand on this issue to hurt the city for their own self-interest. And not as when they speak to you, they're not able to stand as a firm man. And I'm here as a man of faith to let you know the pain I see in the families, the immigrant families of the city is tremendous than what the casino is proposing to bring to Brockton. And you heard very well what my brother pastor told you, what that 10, whatever it is, will give to us. So please make a decision that is going to affect the future generation of Brockton. I love Brockton. I've been here for 20 years as a priest, and I work hard. I didn't get paid to stand for the casino, and I could if I wanted to do, like many of them are here. And you see how the names, how their life experience exchange. They all know each other by names. That's the city we live in, Brockton. No more champion here, but seeing corruption, corrupt people we have. And that's why we keep going down and down. And if you are here to help us, help us build with the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Viviana Sapien, Mike Chiula, Patricia Wright. Hello, my name is Viviana and I have been with Rivers Casino Displains, a Rush Street gaming property for a little over two and a half years. I started out in the customer service department and I'm here to speak about the many team member benefits available at Rivers Casino. We all have goals. My personal goals are to get married, complete a master's program, and someday own four dogs. <laughs> Before working with Rivers, I had applied to several master's programs, got accepted, and unfortunately I had to decline because the funding was just not there for me. When I got to Rivers, I could not believe that they offered a team member scholarship program for both team members and eligible dependents. I heard amazing stories about uh, coworkers, how they put their children through college. One of my coworkers even put his grandchildren through college. I have taken advantage of this program and I am very proud to say that this August, I will be graduating with a master's in integrated marketing and communications. This scholarship has covered all four semesters, fall and spring for me. In my academic journey, Rivers has been amazing at accommodating both my schedule and understanding my study demands. I have since transitioned into the marketing department for Rivers Casino where I can directly apply what I learn in my class to real life experiences. I have never worked for a company who cares so much and I've never worked for a company who believes in me so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Shula. I just want to mention something that wasn't really covered very clearly. The, uh, the, the Brockton Fairgrounds is in Ward 1. And during the, during the vote for the, during the vote, what happened? Ward 1 voted against it. I just want to mention that to you. Okay, thank you very you had much. Seven, I think it was seven wards, and they voted against having a casino. I just want, that wasn't covered. That's Thank very you. important. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Wright, David Vatthana Thong, Abraham Ways. Can I just make a quick incision here that I run a business in Brockton, and I don't think our mayor has got is, our interest in... What is your name, sir? Robert Golka. I don't think our mayor has our interest in heart having the... Me, organization think, paying all this money. I don't so think you're on our sign-up sheet here, and there are other people who are ahead of you. I just say we don't need a casino. Patricia Wright. He left. Okay. Huh? David. Batanabon. Thank you. <laughs> Batanabon. Got I was it. a smart kid back in kindergarten. <laughs> um, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. My name is David Batanabon. I'm an employee with uh, Sugar House Casino Rush Free Gaming. I'm a pit manager there. I've been with uh, Sugar House Casino since day one in 2010. 2013, because of Rush Street Gaming and Sugar House Casino, I was nominated for the Emerging Leader Award, top 40 professional in the gaming industry under the age of 40. I was one of seven winners out of over 10,000 applicants. Um, Sugar House culture is very unique and very more of a family-oriented atmosphere. 
and no other company can compare it to Sugar House Rush Street Waste. Working for a company that identify as a core, uh, fund as a core value, Sugar House has created over a thousand jobs uh, with opportunities for full medical benefits, 401k, tuition reimbursement, along with service benefits for being nice to guests and fe fellow coworkers. Attendance bonus for hourly employees for showing up for work on time, for having a perfect attendance. Sugar House giving back to community. And thanks, on Thanksgiving, we donated over 1,200 turkeys and canned food back to the community. <clears throat> we also, as a matter of fact, Friday just passed, we had a denim, denim day. We donated over $7,000 to the Police Athletic League for us to wear denim jeans to work, a dress down day. Um, I wanna talk about one of our employees. About a year and a half ago, he lost his family and all, everything that he owned to a, dra a tragic fire. Our GM heard news of it. We had pallets of houseware items and clothing and money to donate to him. Um, it, it's very f touching and feeling that we have a company like this that cares so much for the employees and the community. Um, thank you for your time. It was an honor to speak on behalf of a, com of a company that I love and I'm proud to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Abraham Ways, Melvin Carlisle, Dwayne Denny. Good evening. Good my evening. name is Good Abraham Waya. Waya, my apologies. Waya. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the commission. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Um, you have heard many repetitions of many things you've already heard many times before, and you have to look as intent and as serious as possible, even though you have heard it before and you can repeat it yourselves, but thank you so much for doing that. I am a United Methodist pastor. I was appointed to Brockton by the bishop, and when I was appointed, the first thing I did was to go online and check Brockton. I heard everything that the mayor mentioned a moment ago, and all through the list is all the negative things about the city. And in the midst of all the negative things, there was this shining light that that year that I came to Brockton, Brockton High School was at the top of one of the 100 out of the 21,000 high schools in this country. I thought that was a great thing. And I got here, and uh, we've had a wonderful time being, I've had a wonderful time being a minister in this city. Uh, a moment ago, Mr. Bloom mentioned something about his own life journey and the wonderful work his mother did to raise him and his, and his uh, sister. And I want to thank God for that, that um, she did not, at the time that the temptations might have been there, she did not take the $95 for his semester tuition and gamble with it at a school or at a, at a casino somewhere. Had she done so, he probably wouldn't be here today and he probably wouldn't have been in the charity he has been doing, uh, at least at that point. So I want to thank God that that happened. I think that one of the dangers we have in this, uh, in this conversation is that we forget, we look at the dollar figures and that is great. The city of Rockton wants money, that's understandable. But much of this money is coming from people's pocket. This is not money as in a manufacturing industry or somewhere you make something and you make a profit out of it. This is all money coming out of people's pockets. And I'm, if I were a betting person, I would bet that majority of you and maybe even the people who are represented here supporting it, do not themselves bet. They will not themselves gamble. They will not take out their money and put it in the gambling machine because they, you know, we want the money. Yes, we want every, but it comes out of somebody else's pocket. And I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you strongly with all that you have heard to not grant a license for a casino in the city of Brockton. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Also, Melvin Carlisle, is that you? Yes, sir, that's and me. Dwayne Penny and Gary Leonard, Michael Matthew, I think. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, thank you for this opportunity. I'll be brief. My name is Melvin Carlisle. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Melvin Carlisle. Because of its hiring and screening process, Rush Street's gaining properties more specific specifically the Rivers Casino in Pittsburgh, has been voted best place to work 
and best casino for six straight years. Rush Street Gaming hires employees with integrity, treats its employees with respect, and offers competitive rates of pay and excellent benefits. As with any hiring process, you have to weed out those that do not have a sound work ethic. I work in the security department at the Rivers Casino in Pittsburgh as an entrance control officer. And along with my team members, I'm responsible for meeting and greeting guests as they enter our casino. Our primary function is the prevention of underage access to the gaming floor. We check over 28,000 IDs per month. From September 2013 to November 2015, we had over 750 consecutive days without incident. Since November 2015, our current run without incident is over 100 days. This is a difficult task given the proficiency of those making and selling fake IDs to underagers. I have worked for many companies over the past 50 years. Most of those were with Verizon Communications, formerly Mom Bell or Bell Telephone, renamed to Bell Atlantic, and finally Verizon Communications. Verizon is a very solid company offering its employees good wages and benefits. Since signing on with the Rivers Casino in 2011, I must say this company is by far the best employer I have had across my working career. In 2012, I was voted Employee of the Year by over 2,000 of my peers. What an honor. The Rivers Casino in Pittsburgh is involved with the local community through many community projects, such as riverbank cleanup, restoration and painting of various buildings and sites, and through donations. I am extremely proud and pleased to be part of the Rush Street Gaming Team at the Rivers Casino in Pittsburgh. I urge you to review the success of other Rush Street Gaming properties and surrounding communities as you render your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dwayne Denny, Gary Leonard, Michael Matthew or Mathen, Stephen Torrey, Howard Missel, Misselman, uh, Belange, Belange Jean, my apologies if I'm getting these wrong, Jeffrey Anatoly, um, Steve Warner, Conley Schrag, Cash, Ashley Schrag, Alan Peralt snuck in. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, my name is Ashley Schrag, and I've been with Rush Street for five years. Um, I'm going to share my personal journey with you. I started at um, Sugar House Casino at 21. I was lost, didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I lived in a rough part of Philadelphia, um, low-income family. Um, I started at Sugar House as a player service agent, entry level, and I quickly fell in love. I considered the guest and my coworkers family. Um, after that, I was promoted to a guest service rep where I worked under the best management who guided me and really gave me the opportunity to be myself and learn valuable career opportunities and skills. Um, about a year ago, I was promoted to guest service manager at the age of 25 um, at Rivers Casino without a degree. I can say right now I would not be the woman I am today if it wasn't for Sugar House and Rivers. They are truly my family and they gave me the opportunity when I didn't think I had one. Um, they believed in me when I didn't believe myself and they really have changed my life. Um, so our fundamentals at Rush Street are fun, service, integrity, and respect. And our core values, they're not just words written on paper. They are engraved in the, our team members' hearts. We truly live and breathe those values. Um, our team members, we care about them so much and we, are always showing them appreciation, finding new ways to really just give them um, the appreciation they deserve for going out there and working hard. Um, 
at the end of the day, they are our most valuable asset. Um, our service is excellent, and if you believe, if you don't believe me, you can read all of our, our survey comments from our guests. They will tell you that the reason they choose Rivers is because of our team members. All casinos have table games, all casinos have slots, but our service is beyond everyone else. So that's why they choose us, because when they come into Rivers, they feel like family. Um, so if you're looking for a casino that's really going to make a positive impact on your community, your team members, and the guests that enter those doors, then adopt us. Let us become part of your Boston family. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful night. That's all right. Thanks for having me. Uh, I didn't write anything down. I don't think there's a need to. Uh, I just want to reiterate what my friend Pat Lawton said. She said everything I was thinking. I uh, wanted to add a couple of things. I was at the meeting in Holbrook, and there was a gentleman there who quoted and I quoted said, if you go to a casino, you're becoming drunk, you start shooting heroin, and you beat up your spouse. Well, three days later, I went to my 60th birthday party. I know you can't believe I'm 60. At, the, at Foxwoods with all my boys and girls, I didn't drink, I didn't shoot any heroin, and I didn't call my ex-wife and beat her up. So I don't know where he got his facts from, but as far as I'm concerned about gambling, it's, to me it's being an adult. That's how I look at it. I work 95 hours a week. I make decent money. I love gambling, but I don't spend my life gambling. It's a blast. That's how I look at it. Uh, my opinion is this. Brockton had a vote. And the vote was yes. I don't care if it was by one, like Hitler won, or by 148. I don't, and, and if money, nobody knows that facts about Hitler, look it up because it's the truth. Uh, but the deal is this. It was a vote. So my question is, again, why are we here? If it, was, if it was a vote, whether it was by one or 148. I mean, I know you guys got a job to do. And uh, my other question is this. If you guys do not grant this casino, then we should change the voting process in Massachusetts. That's all I have to say. Good evening, Commission. Leonidas Fieldsfield, Jr., East Bridgewater. I was a resident of Brockton, but moved. But the reason I'm here tonight in 2004, I was appointed national rep for the Veterans Administration with VA hospitals throughout New England. One of the facilities was Brockton. As you people drove down here tonight, you came by the Brockton VA hospital. I stood in a meeting several years ago that I was told I couldn't speak. You were on the verge of closing that hospital. I'm a Vietnam veteran, 67, 68. I didn't see my children until they were six months old. But tonight we heard that they're going to do is spend $7 million on Belmont Street. Commonwealth of Massachusetts has just deferred three and a half million dollars to run the Brockton High School. As far as fast, fast track money goes, Congress and the Senate in November voted six hundred million dollars for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts over the next five years. We presently handle 192 calls a day in the city of Brockton on ambulances. 192, 000, 192 runs a day by the fire department. That's 132,000 runs a year. They've just about spent $1.2 million on the bond issue to buy a new fire truck. Ten, several million dollars to for other things. The money is not here in the city of Brockton. 1991, I had a city contract with the city of Brockton. They were on the verge of bankruptcy with the company I worked for. They could have paid the oil bill for the company I worked for. Business is usual in the city of here. When you leave here tonight, you're all fine fellows. Bite the bullet as we did in Vietnam. I came back, I knew the late Jimmy Shane who wrote the any Vietnam War bill. I was asked to leave a meeting. They didn't want to hear from us. But I'm speaking for the veterans at 22, 22 a day dying through suicides. A hundred days dying in this country for old, ODs. The city of Rockland thinks that they're going to bid a drug addict at the VA hospital. Once you transport that ambulance to the Brockton VA hospital, that patient is subject to arrest under federal law. I was instrumental in bringing a $3.2 million shelter on Spring Street. There's no such thing as a homeless veteran in the United States of America today unless you want to be. But you're not going to help a guy leaving the VA hospital who has a drinking problem or a gambling problem. Has there been an impact study by the federal government on what it's going to do to the VA within this area? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, I'm Bob Emery. I thank the Commission for a chance to speak. Uh, a lot of what I was going to say has already been covered, so I hopefully it will be real quick. 
I've been watching the property values in Brockton now. I was born and raised in Brockton. I lived in Brockton probably half my life. I've been watching the property values, primarily residential. Five years ago, there were a lot of houses available for $100,000. Try to find one now. Property values have been going up steadily the past few years. New housing stats are going up. The houses are being built and being sold. Brockton is slowly coming back in the residential market. We still need a lot of work in commercial stuff. I honestly don't think the, uh, the casino is, is the way to go. It is going to bring crime. Yeah, they're going to, the casino people are going to give us extra money. We're going to spend that and more taking care of the crime that comes because they're here. And the property values around, particularly close to that casino, will go down. That isn't a, a ghost town up there. It's mostly residential. The houses are in good shape and they're almost all occupied. Completely different situation than some of the places they've been to. Um, I don't think that you're going to see, uh, Brockton right now, by the way, has, crime rate is down a little bit, according to the state, as reported on Channel 25 and Channel 4 this past January. Overall crime in Brockton is down. Murders are up. Brockton rates number three in the state for, mur for the murder rate, Boston first, uh, Springfield second. So, and, and a, a destination resort, maybe I can give them a couple of ideas. Come to beautiful Brockton on the shores of the Salisbury River. That sounds interesting. Or if you want exciting, come to Brock, exciting Brockton, murder capital of the South Shore. That's where the work, the money needs to go. That's where the work needs to go. We don't need another attraction that's going to bring more crime, more pain, and things like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just before you start, are you Mr. Shrevin? I pronounce it Sieben. Sieben, sorry. Yeah. My handwriting, my apologies. Right. Also, Linda Bishop, Janice Schuster, Carol Delory. Yes, sir. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Buster Sieben. I've been a citizen here for about 38 years. And just a slightly different um, presentation here. Um, we each see the world from our own lens, and we're talking about the financial needs in Brompton. And as a follower, of Jesus Christ, I'm persuaded that having a casino in Brockton as our first choice, at least certainly it's not the wisest answer as I understand um, how Jesus taught. We're about to celebrate Easter in a few weeks. That's a historical fact. And on the subject of money, Jesus is an authority. He spoke more on money than he did heaven and hell combined. And he promises that a city that will follow Christ, that will put him first, is a city that will be healed, will have its needs met, that will have adequate, and really more than adequate. The people that I personally have worked with over the years who have embraced the message of Christ, have experienced healing in their lives, those who have put other values first have really missed the kind of healing that they could have had. And so my encouragement, I'm persuaded that the casino from what, the little that I've studied, and it's only a little bit about casinos, that they haven't produced worldwide or United States wide health in communities. There's been real detriments. But any place, any place where Christ is embraced, there's blessing. And so, I don't know how you'll deal with that. I just offer that as my thoughts concerning our city, that I want to be healed. And I believe that our, our, our combined, all of us together, are just trusting the Lord and honoring Him is the way for our city to be healed. He's got very, very, meaning Jesus, has very, very deep pockets. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Bishop, Janice Schuster, Carol Delory, Carolyn Krikorian, Grant Krikorian. Yes, sir. I'm Grant, Grant Krikorian. I'm a resident of Brockton for over 40 years. And uh, I oppose the casino for many reasons, but I have uh, one reason in particular that's very personal to me. My wife and I were teachers in the Brockton Public Schools for over 50 years combined until we retired. Our three children went right through the Brockton schools. Brockton schools have and continue to offer a wonderful education to our students. 
I believe the idea of a casino located across from the high school is a travesty and an offense to the students of Brockton High School. Our students in Brockton are taught to be people of high moral character, to value long-range goals, to value the ethic of hard work. A casino is the antithesis of these values with its get-rich-quick gambling. Um, I noted that the, the folks from Rush Street Gaming spoke for about an hour and a half. They mentioned the high school exactly once regarding pedestrian safety. Do they care about our children? I'm disappointed in the city council who do not oppose the casino. I'm extremely disappointed in the chairman of the school committee, the superintendent of schools, and the school committee who have not opposed the casino. I believe they have put cash ahead of character. I believe they have put money ahead of morality. Our children deserve better. And in closing, I'd like to point to that sign, the most important word in that sign, ethical. I implore the commission to do the ethical thing in the interest of our children and our citizens and not approve the casino. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Arnold, Arnold is it France or France? Anna Rogers, John Simpson, Anne Hanyadi, Louisa Serrano, Tracy Gutierrez, Diane Ransom. Hello. But I want a casino that benefits us so much that uh, they need to organize food drives. Um, okay. I don't feel these people have any idea at all what Brockton is about. And a good neighbor, I don't think, would do this type of thing that they're trying to do here. Um, they're not even here yet, and they're trying to plan on how to expand. I have, I opposed for three reasons. One, we need to make it possible for children to thrive in this city. We need to make it more inviting for people to want to raise families here. We need to take pride and care in what we place here. People live here, so yes, location is everything. We do not want another Boston without any parking, houses being added onto houses, and the only way to grow is to build vertically and not horizontally. We have enough here to cause people to be unhappy due to litter, drugs, gangs, prostitution, bar establishments, crimes, homelessness, and all over ugliness. And I think it's really unfair that somebody's gonna point the finger at our newly elected governor who is absolutely trying and really wanting to help these people out, help us out. Our city wasn't always like this. What, what, what it came down to as evacuation plan years ago was school choice. The elite could get their children out of this school system, which left nobody to care about this city and nobody to invest in it. But I tell you what, I don't believe that these people plan on investing here for us. I mean, that's just common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Sabine, Carla Toussaint, Toussaint, Kinsley, oh, something or other starts with an O. Kinsley, how about just Kinsley? Jerry Stewart, Jack Lally, already spoke. Amanda Brown, Brian Curvin, Curvin. Last name on the list. <laughs> right. Good things happen to he who waits. 3.30. I uh, just want to say a couple things. And of course, being here this long, a lot of things have been repetitive said. Move the mic towards your mouth. Towards me, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Me too. Uh, 1976, I moved here to Brockton. My mom, and my dad, and my 12 brothers and sisters. Um, we went to the schools. We've done everything here, and it's not up to the commission or up to the clergy 
to tell people how to live or how to set morals for their own children. And if I went across the street to the casino, I'd get whacked. Uh, I got two kids, one in high school and one just graduated. The last thing a teenage boy wants is cameras, security around. They want privacy. So I don't think that's going to be such a big problem. Um, second thing is we're voting. You know, whether you win by one or four, you're still, you're still voting. Um, I voted today for the next president. You can't tell me my vote doesn't count. It's no take backs. It's, it's my constitutional right, you know? And I'm just, I'm embarrassed with the clergy that can't separate state and church. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That is all the names we have on our list. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, so, dear commission members, uh, thank you what for... What is your name, uh, sir? It's uh, Jace Stewart. Jace Stewart? Yes. J-A-S-S. -S, last name S-T-E-W-A-R-T. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm a former city councilor at large here in Brockton. I served three terms, decided not to seek re-election last year, but I continue to live in Brockton. Uh, I am in full support of the casino proposal uh, from Rush Gaming. I voted in favor of having the proposal sent to the ballot um, when it was voted on earlier. As you know the process, the city council has the obligation to review a proposal, and if it believed it were not a suitable proposal for the city, it could have elected not to have sent that proposal to the ballot. Um, I'm not gonna repeat um, what I believe to be uh, the, the really um, sort of stellar reputation of the organization, uh, and, it, and the fact that it's invested in a number of landmark um, facilities uh, throughout the country, uh, including Daniel Hall here in Boston, uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Center, uh, the Four Seasons in Philadelphia, and some other establishments. Um, on the issue of crime, um, I did research, and I know it's important to look at data overall in terms of, of gaming and its impact on communities, and we know that data is mixed. But we have a really unique opportunity here to look at a specific organization and look at its specific facilities throughout the country to see the impact of those facilities uh, on those communities. Uh, so we're fortunate in that way, and I've, I've done that research, which helped uh, me to come to my conclusion earlier. So in every location where Rush Gaming has a casino, a crime has either remained constant or decreased. Uh, and in those places where mayors and police chiefs were initially hesitant about the facility. They are now writing letters of support uh, for the casino and its positive impact on the community in those, in those areas. Uh, we also know that here locally, the uh, police patrolman's union has endorsed this casino uh, and they are encouraging uh, residents to uh, support the project as well. So we would assume that if police is in fact in support of the project, that should speak volumes to the issue of its neutral to positive impact on crime. Um, on the issue of traffic, um, frankly, it's in the best interest of the casino to ensure that traffic um, flows easily because their business is based on return customers. So if folks have a hard time getting to the casino, uh, then they're practically out of business. And so the traffic plan is on the city's website, and we see that, in fact, the casino is proposing to make significant improvements to infrastructure, making the roadways better, the sidewalks safer, including for the Brighton High School students. So I'm almost out of time. I'll, I'll wrap up here with um, the issue of... Mr. Stewart, I'm sorry. Your, your time is up. We've, okay. we've stopped everybody else okay. as well. So I'm in support of the casino, okay. and uh, I'm going to submit my okay, um, comments in writing. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, we do have uh, in our practice the opportunity for the applicant to speak at the end if they want, if there's something they wanted to respond to, not to go back over any of the old arguments, but if there was new data points, we I think are going to not ask any questions. Uh, we will save any questions that we have for our next meeting. We're not going to close this when we, when we 
reconvene this meeting. If you, whatever it's, yeah, if you yeah, have the right. I, I will be brief. I just wanted to cover one issue that has been raised by the United Dairy Union, okay? Uh, basically, we respect the rights of our employees to choose whether they want to have a union or not and have an election under the NLRB rules. Uh, I, I believe that Unite Here has not called for an election because they don't think they could win the election because I don't think the majority of the employees uh, would vote for one in, an, in, an, in a fair election. We do have uh, a union in Philadelphia, the Carpenters Union that covers a group. We have the operating engineers in Pittsburgh that cover a group. We have uh, kind of contracts with both of them, with good relationships. Uh, in New York, by law, we were required to enter into a labor peace agreement, and we have done so uh, and have good relationships with the New York hotel and, metal, and uh, motel workers, which is actually affiliated with Unite here. So uh, the bottom line of what I'm saying is that it, we respect the employees' rights, and if there's an election, they elect to have a union, we'll negotiate in good faith and have a contract. We've done that uh, in, certain, in the situations where that's arisen. Thank you very much. Any commissioners have anything else to say other than it's been a long day? <laughs> um, so I would have a, uh, a motion to suspend this meeting. Uh, we will not close it. Uh, we will convene again uh, sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, where there will be a final opportunity for people to respond to anything that hasn't been dealt with, uh, and um, I'd have a motion to suspend it. So moved. Second? Second. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? No. Aye. No. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for coming and for spending so much time with us.